Greetings, welcome to Central Apologetics. This is Rob, and this is going to be a special epic review. Get your popcorn out. Um, so this is going to be a review on a particular individual. His name is Michael Petro, specifically on his book called Access Behind the Veil. Uh, what I decided to do was I contacted about 80 different scholars to review the book and uh, it all it all stemmed from I made a off the cuff remark on on a prior live stream saying I can I wouldn't be surprised if, if I could get 20 scholars and quite a number of them actually did respond um, uh, scheduling conflicts are sort of like here and there so let's just say the majority of them I am you know touching to you know I'm, I'm sort of like gauging to see whether it's it's necessary or not and so on but so far i've put together five scholars um and let's just say it's all added up to about four hours of content just these five now you might be wondering is the very long uh um you know time lapse is it is it very long because we're going through the entire book and the <laughs> And the rule is not really. Um, basically, I'm only sticking with the preface and a little bit of the preface and a little bit of the introduction. I want to stay within the parameters of fair use. I want to stay within the parameters of, of you know, uh, where as far as so-called copyright claims and so on, that can be avoided. And sure enough, I've I've basically done that because. Um, you know, not only have I bought the book, right, so I can actually fairly critique the entire book if I wanted, but there's also a free preview of his book on Google Books. So, um, based on that alone, you'll actually see me bring up Google Books, and you'll actually see Google Books appear on the side while I talk with the relevant scholar. And, yes, that being said, the four hours is due to the fact that just the preface and just the introduction required more than just five minutes or more than just even 30 minutes of, of like a reflection by the scholar. The scholar needed at least an hour to sort of just get off the chest, you know, the problems that's associated with that. So that being said, I decided to uh, compile just those five scholars for now uh, this is basically part one. Part two will bring on another five, give or take. And uh, yeah, um, I hope this is educational, enjoyable, I hope also edifying. And specifically though, uh, my heart does, my, uh, not, not just my heart, but even my prayers goes to those who are in the voice of healing that, uh, and you too, Michael Petro, that you come to acknowledge the the true nature of the gospel and 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 you know in this case remove yourself from the the dark gnostic esoteric um teachings that you enslave your followers with so um that being said the first particular scholar that i want to introduce is his name is michael heiser now mike because he's going through some health issues at the moment he recommended that I replay, and not just replay, but also transcribe into text a couple of his past episodes that directly tackle the relevant arguments that's in the preface and the intro. So, um, that being said, um, understand first and foremost that in the preface and in the introduction, uh, there's two things that Mike is going to respond to. He's he's going to respond to the claim that Jesus means Hail Zeus. And this particular claim you'll actually see more so like you'll actually see the, the book itself being read from when I when you know when I when you see me talk with the other scholars. But since this is more or less a sort of like direct audio to video edit right now, uh, I'm just going to summarize basically what Petro argues. So the first clip that Heiser will uh, talk about was a couple of years ago, actually, where this myth of Jesus means Hail Zeus is basically circulating. 
And then the second, uh, uh, you know, misunderstanding is all to do with the word mus musterion uh, or secret or whatever, whenever that occurs in um, in the New Testament. Again, Petro in the preface and also in the intro, he talks about you know the mysteries of the kingdom and you know the, and he'll use wacky terminology like the seed is sperm and we need to be, and then once you get impregnated by the the wisdom of Jesus then these so-called mysteries will unravel supposedly in, in other words supposedly until until Petro there hasn't been any unraveling or apocalypsis or like an unveiling of the mysteries um, so that's a pretty audacious claim on Petro's part and so that being said uh, just so I can I can conclude on that point. Here's particularly uh, a, a, a pretty much up-to-date scholarly, so it's an evangelical exegetical commentary on Ephesians by S. M. Ball, Lexham Press. This is this is an academic commentary, and under the context of the mystery, right? There's a particular excursus I want to read, and then I'm going to play the the Michael Heiser clip through. So he says, formerly it was popular to understand Paul in Ephesians and elsewhere as adapting terms and concepts for pagan mystery religions. Certainly when the Ephesians heard Paul speak of the mystery, here's your musterion here, and notice it's not just in Ephesians, it's in Corinthians and also in Colossians, they might hear it with two common religious meanings in their context. Public ceremonial rites associated with Artemis Ephesia, um, and uh, mystic rites and sacrifices. So notice you have a couple of like Greek terminology. So you have this particular Greek terminology, right? The mystic rites of the goddess, and this particular Greek terminology, the mystic rites and sacrifices. And so therefore, this is classic mis mystery religions, especially one connected with Dionysius. Indeed, recent archaeological work in the terrace houses of, of Ephesus have yielded some interesting results, including the find of a chamber as accessed only by crawling through a small passageway into a room with one small upper window. The chamber is understood as a place for conducting mystery rites for Dionysius in this home, which has other features of cult practices. In the pagan mystery cults, an initiate usually viewed a mysterious sacred object or participated in some kind of secret experience. There is no more poignant example of this than Plutarch's cons consolation to his wife at the death of their infant daughter, when he reminds her of the immortality of the soul as taught through, quote, the mystic formulas of Dionysiac rites, the knowledge of which we who are participants share with each other. For Paul, now, now here's the, you know, the reflection, right? What's the Christian engagement with a term that's already used in Greco-Roman paganism? It's not something that's just brand new to Paul and made up by Paul and somehow, you know, Jesus and God works, works like this. This is already, the term is already used culturally. So when Christians come on the scene, what does Paul do? So for Paul, though, mystery is a redemptive historical term, not a secret experience or knowledge given to a select group of initiates. The mystery of Christ had been hidden for long ages earlier but specifically in the sense that Christ's cross-work and ascension to all power had not yet been accomplished. There was sufficient revelation of Christ available for all the Old Testament saints as their heritage. Even if the particulars of God's redemptive accomplishment had been hidden, quote, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. But now... Okay, so now notice this. There's a there's already Paul being a Jew. There's already the context of the Torah in his mind. He's he, in other words, he's like, hey, look, I I also understand secrets and mysteries even in the Torah in this sense. But how does Paul explain it? And so here, Essenbach explains. But now God has openly disclosed this mystery in the fullness of time. Okay, Ephesians 1.10 very clearly says, To usher in the fullness of the times and to bring together in the Messiah all things in heaven and earth. And Galatians 4.4, 4, When the appropriate time came, or like in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born by woman, born under the law. 
So now the mystery has been undone. It's 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 opened. It's it's no longer a mystery. It's it's laid bare for all to see. And so then he continues, and Paul and others have been entrusted with its open dissemination through the gospel. So, you know, Ephesians 6.19, pray also for me so that when I begin to speak, the right words will come to me. Then I will boldly make known the secret of the gospel. So the mystery is a mystery no more. And God's wisdom regarding worldwide acceptance of anyone without discrimination by faith in Christ is openly proclaimed. So uh, I introduce you now to Mike Heiser, who um, is a fantastic scholar. He's done work on the unseen realm, and I recommend you buy his books in, in that regard. But, but without further ado, here's Mike Heiser. Okay. There's a there's a, a really good scholarly word for this, and uh, you just, again, just want you to be listening here so you don't miss it. And that word is bunk. Okay, it is it is utter nonsense. If you come across someone that's saying Jesus comes from Zeus, you should just hang a sign around their neck that says, "I don't know the Greek alphabet, and I can't spell any words in Greek." Okay, Jesus comes from Hebrew Yehoshua or Yeshua. It was the shorter form occurred, it was common after the exile. When that was, when the, the Old Testament was translated, put into Greek at the Septuagint, they retained the short one, Yeshua, and then they made it declinable in Greek. That means that you could have a nominative form, an accusative form, so on and so forth. They made it declinable by adding an S at the end. And they made Jesus. Jesus, the S sound there, both of them, are sigmas in the Greek alphabet. Zeus is a zeta, z. So Jesus spelled with a sigma, Zeus spelled with a zeta. Okay? They're not even the same letter in the Greek alphabet. And it's very easy, again, for anyone who knows the languages to know where Jesus came from. It's a, it's a transliteration with an S added in Greek to make it declinable. That's all it is. The Dictionary of Paul and his letters has a nice little comment here. Again, it's kind of interesting. Mystery, musterion in Greek, appears 21 times in Paul's letters out of a total 27 New Testament occurrences. So overwhelmingly, it's Pauline. Usually it points not to some future event hidden in God's plan. Usually it's not about the future, but to his decisive action in Christ here and now. It actually refers to the past and the present, not really to the future. It's just kind of an interesting observation, and it's an interesting term for that. Here are some of the, the passages that, ta that, that mention mystery. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Again, this idea of this secret and hidden wisdom, you know, that, that's, that, that's going to, you know, it's, going to, it's referring to the gospel, which is the mystery, you know, is something that the hostile supernatural powers, they didn't know, they didn't understand it. If they did, they would have never crucified Jesus. I talk about this in Unseen Realm. Now, Dictionary of Paul in his letters comments in, in this regard. So you, that you know, that, again, this just isn't Mike's take on the passage. I mean, this is, I, I'm well in the mainstream here with, with that whole idea that the gospel itself, the elements of the gospel, what, what the plan actually was, how it was going to work was cryptic. Uh, the DPL, Peter O'Brien writes this, The mystery which focuses on salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ is not new, for God had decreed it before the ages, 1 Corinthians 2, 7. It has been kept hidden from the rulers of this world. You know, the guy, in other words, God came up with the plan before the foundation of the world, but it was kept hidden from the rulers of this world. Only ignorance of the mystery can explain their crucifixion of the Lord of glory. But now... On the other side of it, now the mystery of God's salvific plan, which includes the divine inheritance, is being revealed through his spirit. That's the end of the DPL quote. Romans 16, 25 and 26 says this, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, again, 
even the disciples, the disciples could read the Old Testament and they couldn't figure this out. The reference there to, to the mystery, you know, being sort of in, you know, in the text, in the Old Testament, the prophetic writings, it, it goes back again. If you've read Unseen Realm, this is all familiar, and I apologize a little bit for it for, for those who haven't. Yes, all the elements of the plan of salvation are in the Old Testament scriptures, but they're not connected. The data points are left unconnected. It's fragmentary intentionally. It's intentionally that the picture, the mosaic, is intentionally obscured by virtue of the scattering of the pieces. But it's all there, and in hindsight, they could look, and they did look and understand. But you know, before you, know, before you had the cross— None of that was clear. After you have the, claw, the cross, now you can see how things, you know, fit together, how, how it all came, you know, how it all came together. Romans 11, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Paul speaking to Jews. A partial hardening has come upon Israel, and there's a re- good reference to ethnic Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then, you know, and then Paul follows this by saying, and in this, all Israel will be saved. So there's some connection here between the Gentiles being grafted in. And Paul says that was a mystery, you know, that the Gentiles would become full heirs, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, but that, that has some role to play in the future of all Israel being saved, which must include in some way ethnic Israel, even though ethnic Israel, you know, the, the ethnic Israel as as a body of, of believers as the family of God, because a lot of ethnic is, Israelites were not in the family of God at the end of the old at the end of the day in the Old Testament. They went off and worshipped Baal. The fact that you were an Israelite didn't mean salvation. You had to believe. It's the same thing across the, the, the Testaments. So you can't conflate ethnic Israel with the family of God either. And that, that, that's, it's just a flaw in, in, in thought when people do that for whatever reason. Usually they do it to argue the, against or for some view of eschatology. But it doesn't even work in the Old Testament. Okay? But Paul is connecting these things, even though you have this conflation of the body of Christ with, with the, the, the people who are really in the family of God, and that included you know, the, the commonwealth of Israel. Again, that, they're all part of the picture, but in, on either side of it, you have to believe. You can't go worship Baal. You can't have any other god. You have to put your faith in Yahweh and his promises. You have to put your faith in Christ and his promises. And Christ is Yahweh in the flesh. And all these things are important. They're all part of the, of the whole picture. Paul conflates those things, but yet they all have sort of individual aspects and individual roles as well. So you just have to come to grips with that. Again, the mystery is Christ's role. This is DPL again. Christ's role in the salvation of humanity. You know, he he's... You know, he's he's he has to reset everything. He is the he is the figure that causes the resetting, the return, the full the coming full circle of creation the way God in it intended it to be. What did God intend? He wanted a human family, rightly related to him. The only way that that's going to happen after it's just been blown to bits is Jesus and what happens on the cross. That's why Paul can speak of reconciliation as this. This sort of grand cosmic superstructural resetting, restoring of creation, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the broadest sense. And, and again, you, you can't have the incarnation is 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 important because those moral agents that sinned, okay, the ones that actually get offered redemption are the ones that Jesus became like. Who he entered their reality, and that's human beings. Again, we talked about this last time with the whole question of, you know, do can Satan be redeemed and fallen the angels and all that stuff? Hebrews two actually specifically denies that it's about humanity. But nevertheless, all things are going to be restored to the original creation order. Okay, in, in you know, again, in, in the way you know God wanted things to be. But the objects, you know, of redemption in terms of you need to exercise faith now. You need to believe, you know, you have the capacity to make this decision. Okay. Those agents are, again, people. That, again, Hebrews 2, you know, again, specifically denies the other side. So, again, you, you could revisit that episode as well. Now, that's, that's the end of Colossians 1. And we'll just throw into Colossians, you know, the first five verses here, because they essentially are a repetition of this. But I want to get up to ver- up through verse five for the sake of the next episode. Paul writes this in Colossians two. 
for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. There's the reference to mystery in Colossians 2, 2, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the tre- treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, wisdom, it's a key you know, concept to take back to 1 Corinthians 2, that you know, had, had the rulers of this world known, again, they, they would not have done what they did. So there's a link back to what Paul says in that passage. Again, I say this, verse 4, in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Now, there's one thing I want to I want to sort of camp on a little bit here. You know, you've got this statement in Colossians 2. Again, he brings up the mystery and the wisdom and knowledge, again, that are, that are part of the mystery and, and all this sort of stuff. And then he mentions, you know, he doesn't want anybody to delude the Colossians, you know, with, quote, plausible arguments. He doesn't want, he doesn't want them to be removed, go back to the end of Colossians 1, removed from the faith. Because he, he's just told them, you know, you, you have to keep believing. You have to keep believing. You need to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting, not being removed. Again, it's a passive, not being removed from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So, you know, you, you take that concern and you look at chapter two again in light of that concern, and it it's just kind of interesting. It it, it creates this it creates this situation to ask that you know it, it would have been nice you know for Paul to be a little more specific here again because he's got something on his mind here that concerns some subject matter that he believes might be used against the Gentiles to move them away from faith. And that that raises the question, well, what what might that be? What might that be? Again, it, 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 it concerns the mystery. And the mystery had something to do with wisdom and knowledge about Jesus, specifically wisdom and knowledge that the rulers of this world didn't know. Hence, they they went through with the crucifixion. They 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 instigated that you know among you know people to 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 get Jesus killed. So it, it's really interesting because you you could think, well, what is what what would somebody say in relation to all of these pieces, all of these topic pieces? What would someone say to a Gentile that might damage them, that might get them to misperceive the gospel, perhaps maybe? come to the conclusion that, well, we're really not included in this, you know, because we're Gentile. I mean, what, what would do that? I want to take you to a couple of other uh, passages just, again, to, to sort of get you thinking about those, those content items, the mystery, the wisdom, the knowledge, the rulers and the authorities, the principalities and powers who don't know what they need to know, and they go through with the crucifixion, and Paul says, boy, had they known, they would have never, you know, done this. And, all of that, and 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 think about all of those things in relationship to this concern that Paul has, that through plausible arguments, the Gentiles might be moved away from the faith. Okay, just hold on to that. I'm going to read you Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. That sounds like Colossians 1 verse 20, okay? But then you move to Ephesians 3, and there's a little bit more specificity. I'm going to read what I think is probably the clearest statement of the mystery and this issue you know, involving the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Ephesians 3, I'm going to read the first 10 verses. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Let me stop there. It's a clear statement that, you know, you could go read stuff, but you wouldn't know 
you know, the, the people in prior generations just couldn't figure this out. But now to us, we understand it because of the spirit and, it, and because of it's now, it's not then, it, it's not, it's after the cross, it's not before. This mystery, verse six, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which, has, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, least of all the holy ones, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. See, now, now our, our opposition, and you, know, you can even throw in the good guys too, now they understand what the mystery was. Everybody can understand it now. And But the question is, why single the rulers and authorities in heavenly places out in verse 10? Why single them out? I would say because their rebellion contributed to the mess that needed to be fixed. You know, they're, And they're the ones that get duped in 1 Corinthians 2. A DPL, again, tracks on this as well. It's not just Mike. Dictionary of Paul in his letters. In Ephesians 5.32, the mystery points to the union of Christ and the church, and the meaning of which is hidden. Okay, the situation of perceived demonic hostility in Western Asia Minor may have provided a partial motivation for Paul's emphasis on the cosmic mystery, cosmic aspect of the mystery in Ephesians, both in that chapter and, of course, in earlier in the chapter that we just read. It could have stood, back to DPL, it could have stood in deliberate contrast to the Lydian Phrygian mysteries, which were so popular, so as to be a polemic against the possible influence of these mysteries in the churches. According to the Greek magical papyri, and he gives a citation here, a pagan mystery initiation involved the Lord of the Air, which sounds suspiciously like Ephesians 2 too, Prince of the Power of the Air, as indwelling deity, again, in, in that place. That's the end of the quote. So, so what DPL is saying, you know, in Ephesians, and again, Ephesians and Colossians are these twin epistles, there's something going on in the background here about demonic entities, you know, and this Lord of the Air. You know, there's something going on with them. And the, the mystery concept in, in, in the false religion of those places. And he said that, that, that might be why Paul includes them in what he says to the Ephesians and to the Colossians. Paul wants them to know, look, you, you pagans have been taught that the, the powers that you've been worshiping just know everything. They just know what they're doing. You know, they, they're just, they're lords of the air and, you know, they, they have understanding of all mysteries. They don't know squat. Okay, they didn't. They got duped. They got hoodwinked. God pulled one over on them because the real mystery was uniting you, you know, nullifying the power of the rulers and authorities that are over you because of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, all that stuff again, delegitimizing their grasp, their hold on you, their power, their authority on you, which was legitimate. God at one time punished you with this situation. Back at Babel, he divorced you know, the nations. We all know that. You guys have the same worldview in your own writers. Again, Unseen Realm, I've had, we've had conversations on the podcast about this you know, before. You guys all know this, and you might think, here's the key, you, you Gentiles might think that, you know what? You know, we, we, we should obey the powers that are over us, you know, because, okay, maybe they're not so smart. Maybe they got hoodwinked by the Most High, but the Most High put them over us. And so we just feel kind of creeped out or uncertain that we should forsake them and move over to this Jesus. And see, that's Paul's argument. You're, you're not only allowed to do that by the same Most High who gave the rulers and authorities that you've been worshiping, he gave them their, their, their status and their authority, and they, they just you know, went nuts with it and became corrupt and all that. So you're, you're not only allowed to do that by the same Most High who created that situation in judgment back at Babel, but that Most High became a man. And, and that man died for you on the cross. And I am here to tell you that story. So you're not only allowed to do this, he demands that you do this. He wants you to do this. Oh, he's hoping so much that you do this, that you believe 
that you are now members. You can be members of the Commonwealth of Israel. In other words, you can be included back in the family of God, the way God originally intended things to be. But with all of that backdrop, when Paul in Colossians 2, verse 4, is worried about somebody deluding them with plausible arguments, I'm willing to bet, okay, I'm just willing to bet that in the back of Paul's mind, he was concerned about this because here's how you could argue it. Remember, Colossians is all about worshiping angels and other entities and Jewish mysticism stuff. And, okay, he has Jewish opponents. And he also has this, this Gentile problem. Here, here's, here are my two points of speculation. Can how, how, would, how would this information be used to delude Gentiles, to get Gentiles to not listen to Paul? What sort of persuasive argument could there be? You could argue it this way. Part of Jewish mysticism included the idea that the holy ones on earth, the people of God, were the counterparts of the holy ones in heaven. That was a common belief. Maybe the Jewish community used that part of Jewish mysticism as a basis to argue that it was inappropriate for Gentiles to be part of the people of God. Might that work? Maybe. I think it could work on some people. Secondly, Jews also could have argued that Gentiles had their own gods by decision of the Most High, and therefore ought not to have inclusion in the people of God just in principle. Now, granted, they'd have to ignore certain Old Testament passages like Isaiah 66 for that, and it's hard to argue against full Gentile inclusion when the passage is calling Gentiles priests of Yahweh. But, but I mean, they, they could ignore that. But I think somewhere in, in, in these two thoughts, these two speculations that I'm, I'm offering here, I can see where a clever Jew who would understand the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and yet despise, you know, he'd, he'd have to ignore the covenant with Abraham, he'd have to ignore Isaiah 66. I can see where a clever Jew could walk up to a Gentile and say things like, you know, th this Paul is kind of nutty. You know, he claims to be a Jew. He claims to still be worshiping the God of Israel. And don't, I mean, we all know the God of Israel set up the situation. We worship him and you worship these other gods, and that's the way he wanted it. You know, if, if, you, if you listen to what Paul's saying, you're going against the will of the Most High. And, and you might be concerned about either obeying him or, or obeying your own gods because they, they know the situation too. And, and you should be concerned. You, so you shouldn't listen to Paul. You should just let things be as they are. Again, there are some things here that are, that are fairly suggestive of it. You take the data points and you put them together and you imagine what the conversations could be like. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you would, again, have some clever Jews trying to convince Gentiles that you just don't belong here. And, and theologically, you're in jeopardy if you want to be with us. You, you, know, you, you just need to tune Paul out at that point. So again, just throwing that out as we finish you know, up for the day. I think it's really interesting. Again, you have these elements of Jewish mysticism that could include these ideas. And again, it's hard, hard to say how the exact conversation could have, could have you know, gone. But I, I've mentioned before you know, that, that pagan podcast I did and how much material there was you know, in the pagan worldview that, that mimics the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. They, they understood why they were worshiping this God and not that God, because the higher-ups wanted it that way. And for them to step out of line, if you were a thoughtful pagan, you really took this seriously, that's going to trouble you. It's going to trouble you. you. You feel vulnerable, you know, to, to, to the whim of the gods at that point. So it could be, you know, part of the picture here. Okay, my second guest is Dr. David Falk. He's an Egyptologist. His dissertation was on furniture with, with direct relevance to the origins of the Ark of the Covenant and uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, he's, he's an evangelical Christian. He runs a YouTube channel called Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, his work is top-notch work, and it was an absolute blast to talk to him live. Uh, well, like sort of like recording. Uh, David Falk is also a specialist on Gnostic literature and Gnostic, you know, theology. Um, so he was uh, a vital source of information in regards to his reactions here with respect to Petro. So I hope you enjoy this interaction. All right, folks, this is Rob. And I'm here with David Falk. David, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? 
<laughs> I'm doing all right. <laughs> uh, David, who are you? Who am I? Uh, I'm a research associate at the Vancouver School of Theology. I hold a PhD in Egyptology from the University of Liverpool. And my specialty is uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the interconnections between ancient Egypt and the Bible. Very good. Well, David, um, as discussed, we're going to be looking at Petra's book, uh, snippets of his preface and intro, and that's all, in my opinion, that's required to sort of get a feel of what he believes, and I'm interested to hear your raw reaction in, in the process. So here we go. Okay. All right, so he says, and, and, and you know, button like whenever you want to make a, uh, a statement. So he goes, okay. This book is based on a number of the many revelatory teachings given to me straight from God. After many years of hearing and preaching sermons relaying that God's grace covers all sin and that one day a group of believers will be caught up into heaven and avoid massive destruction of the world, I was taken through the veil and he began to reveal the hidden secrets of the kingdom as taught by the early church. All my Christian doctrine leading up to this point went out the window. Since this awakening, I have never been the same. This complete alteration and existence of this book all started with an impregnation of new DNA. This next paragraph, he just gives like family history saying... Yeah, so he's essentially, in that first, yeah. in that first yep. paragraph, he's essentially claiming to be an Old Testament prophet. That's essentially okay. what he's claiming. So he's basically you know, claiming that he had a direct audience in the Divine Throne Room and that um, he's gotten a new revelation. You know, mm. and the fact is that the whole idea, this is, this is self-discrediting right out of the gate. You know, because the Apostle Paul says, if you or an angel out of heaven gives you another gospel other than what we've been given, then he is an anathema. He is to be cursed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this guy's directly claiming that he, he is, he's a prophet with a different gospel. Mm. That should be as far as anyone needs to read right there. And just to clarify, it's pronounced anathema, not anathema. <laughs> yes, it's anathema. Because <laughs> Petra likes to say anathema pretty much in everything. So, <laughs> well, I mean... I mean, the, that word that word gets often butchered too. I mean, because okay. of you know, you know, Christians do mis mispronounce it also, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and it's and it's corollary, uh, uh, Maranatha. It's mm -hmm. not Maranatha. It's Maranatha. Right. So, but um, in that case, it's anathema, to be accursed. Yep. Then he continues, uh, giving the analogy of having his grandfather's DNA in me. He goes, God has made me recognize something tremendously important about genetics and DNA. Yeshua states that the seed is the word, and in his word contains the mysteries of the kingdom. The seed, which also means sperm or the DNA of my grandpa, yod heh vav -He, has yeah, the uh, that's... power to... <laughs> As the power to create universes, I see my mind constantly being impregnated with the seed of creation. Yeah, that's there's there's definitely some anachronism happening there, definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, they weren't thinking in terms of DNA when they wrote the Gospels, you know. Just that wasn't what they were 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 talking about, but the posterity. The seed is the posterity. You know, mm -hmm. when a plant dies, it produces seed and it produces the next generation of plants. You know, similarly, um, yes, there is an aspect of, of, of um, a fatherly lineage there. Okay. Mm. But it's not thinking in terms of DNA. You know, DNA was only discovered really recently, like in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, there's an anachronism here that's that's being introduced here to present a new concept that's not original to the biblical texts, or even in the mind of the biblical writer. Yeah. And 
And in fact, even and in fact, just to clarify, even if God is aware of the actual scientific basis of how all this works, why would God be interested in shoving in a certain mystery using an English terminology? Yeah. In a Semitic culture. Yeah. <laughs> it's. I mean, you can like, see where it says here the yeah. seed, which also means sperm or the DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he's conflating two different concepts. It might mean the sperm. You know, there's a there's a case to be made that it, there's a there's a good case that you mean could be talked about sperm. But then he adds DNA on top of that. Something the ancient writer would have never thought. Right. How about um also uh very quickly I was reading up on in like in the Lexham uh, Bible dictionary I came across and, and then we'll continue with, with the review uh, I came across this definition here because when Petra speaks about in my mind I have this this ability to create universes and so on, because you're an Egyptologist mm -hmm. this, this, this clarification by whoever wrote this goes ancient Egyptians had multiple creation stories and all popular uh, creation myths has got a tomb as its creator, where he he's standing atop a primordial hill. Ace actually creates the first two deities by yeah. either ejaculating or spitting them out. And then there's this notion of conceiving them in the mind. Technically, that's from Ray, but okay, right. And yeah, then, like you know, how Petra says, like in my mind, I'm creating universes because because he, he goes in my, in Venfi theology. Mm -hmm. It's a tar that he uses his heart, thought to plan a creation, and his tongue to command to speak the world into existence. Yeah. It's like, this sounds suspiciously like ancient Near Eastern creation myths. Um, it does, because uh, uh, the, uh, the god Ta were, did fiat creation. You know, that's, right. that's what's being expressed uh, through the um, creation myth of the god Ta, is the idea that you think it in your mind, and you speak it with your words, and it comes into existence. That's fiat creation. Right. Right. Okay. So. So yeah, that's, you know, I see my like as he says here, I see my mind constantly being impregnated with the seed of creation. Then he's like, many times Grandpa has taken me into his glory, where I have seen many wonderful and exciting things. I have seen him heal deaf ears and blind eyes, and even raise the dead. I've come to a point where I truly know that through him all things are possible, for he is limitless in his ability, but his greatest work is us, the creation of his children. The entire universe is only an afterthought. His true heart is to have us come back into our destiny of restoring the earth. One morning he... Whoa, 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 okay. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> the universe is only an afterthought? Well, this, this is a complete denial of Genesis 1. Hmm. You know, where, where God creates the heavens and the earth, and, you know... He creates the di the day and the night and declares it good. He de you know separates the waters and uh, the dry land appears. He calls that good. You know, he creates the heavens, declares that good and fills them with stars and the two major lights and that's good. Mm -hmm. Then he creates mm -hmm. the the fish and that's good. He creates the birds mm -hmm. of the air. That's good. Day six, he creates the beasts of the field. That's good. And then he creates mm -hmm. mankind, and that's very good. Mm -hmm. The universe is not an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It is the setting into which mankind is, is set, which mankind is placed. And then that beautiful imagery, as Walton would say, you know, the, the functional elements mm -hmm. out of chaos comf, comes the functional. The universe the is the temple. Like, right. The it's, universe, it's cosmic temple imagery. It's cosmic yeah. temple imagery. It is the temple mm -hmm. into which he places his, his, his images, mm -hmm. which is mankind. Right. Mankind, the, the, the words for, for, for the creation Salem, of mankind right. is Salem and uh, the moat, which is basically what we would 
you know, in other contexts would be like cultic idols. Mm-hmm. And the idol, and an idol in the ancient Near East is just nothing but, say, a proxy body that is filled by a spirit. Mm. Mankind is, in a sense, kind of a proxy body that God puts His image into. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so the universe isn't the afterthought; it's the sacred space. Mm. Yep. What he's talking about here is 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 more reflective of Gnosticism than it is of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he, I kid you not, uh, you know, I, I hear from, uh, you know, members that, uh, you know, correspond to me. They, they, they send me, you know, like, oh, he just said this and he just said that. Uh, you know, the highly sexualized, the sexually charged nature of his talks. And, mm-hmm. and one of his recent talks, he says... Um, that transgender we are, we we are transgender we are simultaneously man and woman and then he he without even realizing it he quotes from the gospel of thomas he does and and I, by, by the way when i say quote i mean it's as if he's quoting from it where it says women have to be become men in order to be, to be saved he literally says in the spirit uh what means the beast or like like evil is women and, and females and so they have to become well, that was male. Gnostic thought. So it, that it was, is that was, that was very very common in Gnostic thought where um, to, to basically the idea that uh, when the gods were created and, and the origins of Gnosticism are really polytheistic okay you had you had the great God and he created some more gods. And those gods created more gods. And those gods the created Ar- more gods. The archons, right? The archons. From Sophia down, right? No, no. The, and the aeons. They're the aeons. Oh, the, the aeons. The aeons. Yeah, the yeah. aeons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then the aeon, the very last aeon to be created was the demiurge. Mm-hmm. The evil, wicked god who then created the world. And the sparks of the god's creation became angels, demons, and souls of human beings trapped in the more their mortal bodies on planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And the lowest of these trapped souls were women. Mm. So in the Gnostic universe, women are on the very bottom. Yeah. Which is why they had to become like men to be saved. Yeah. They had to be ritually transformed to men. Yeah. Because their souls were so pathetic, they couldn't get there on their own. And this is why, you know, I'm just saying this publicly. Uh, this is why I did my last stream. I titled it A Dangerous Doomsday Gnostic Cult. Because mm-hmm. it's constant. You know, when Jesus says, many will come into my name and will say, I am he and the time is now. That's what Petra does. Yeah. And then I put I then that's a, that's the doomsday element and then the gnostic element is exactly how Dr. Falk has just described one of the classic tenets of gnosticism and verbatim that's what Petra teaches. Mm-hmm. Um, Simon Peter said to him, "Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life." Jesus said, "I myself shall lead her in order to make her male." so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Does this sound negative toward women? Everybody's going, yeah. Guess where this comes from? Are you ready for this, Dan Brown? Are you ready for this, Michael Bajant? Picnic Prince, the whole bunch. That's from the Gospel of Thomas. Oops. Dan Brown didn't tell us about that one. If you want a misogynistic statement, that's my candidate. And it's from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Now I'm prepping you with this because one thing I want you to, uh, I want you to go away with from this session is the fact that 
the idea that Gnosticism elevates women and these Christians over here are basically Neanderthals is just a myth. It is another myth. In fact, you'll, you'll, you'll actually see that in a moment. So in the next paragraph, he goes, he goes, so one morning you showed me his love, his agape love. I couldn't contain it. I wasn't ready for it. I found myself with grandpa's thoughts. You know, it was overwhelming, pouring what the ocean into a teaspoon. What does he mean by agape love? <laughs> I, <laughs> apart from Smokey's <laughs> reaction to this, if you saw that, but <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? But yeah, I mean, I mean really, is, I mean, that's, that's I actually thought, a very bona fide question is what does he mean by agape yeah. love? Because yeah. I'm almost sure he doesn't mean agape love like it means in the original Greek. So explain f further, I'll elaborate for those who may not know. Okay. One of the things that, that circulated through churches for a long time is this, this crummy sermon, uh, which is sometimes called Eros Phileo Agape, mm -hmm. where pastors who don't know Greek try to prove they know Greek by trying to br by trotting out these three terms eros, ag phileo, and agape. And they try to say that eros, that's your, that's your erotic love. Phileo, that's your brotherly love. Agape, that's your divine love. Well, or, or co covenantal love or something like that. Like, yeah, covenantal like, love, some yeah, stupid yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the fact is that in first century Greek, there's actually no difference between phileo and agape. Mm. There's no difference. They mean the exact same thing. There's no divine element to agape. Mm. It's just a synonym for phileo, which means to love. It's nothing more than that. Mm. Is there is there like an analogy you can use in English? Like, because I know the word love. Like, I can't think of another word that means love. But it's spelled differently and pronounced differently. But like, <laughs> oh right, I see. Okay, like I like you, or I love you. You can say adore. Adore, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, okay. Adore and yeah. love it mean exactly the same thing. They just come from right. different etymological roots. Right. Love mm -hmm. is Anglo-Saxon, and adore is French. Now I see what you're saying because that is odd. The the phrase agape love, like mm -hmm. it's it's like he's transliterating the Greek and at the same time putting an English word. Like no one writes like that if you're if you if you're importing say a Greek term, mm -hmm. <laughs> like 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 a love love like what? Yeah, <laughs> what is it's a redundancy? Right, I see. Okay, yeah. but he's probably yeah. inferring something else here. Okay. By by qualifying it with the redundancy, he's probably inferring something else. Mm. Because agape just means love. Mm. So by having that redundancy, he's probably ascribing a meaning to agape that doesn't exist in first century Greek. Right. Okay. Which is why I ask the question, what does he mean by agape? Right. And that's something I've noticed with his book. He just throws terms out, expecting mm -hmm. people to, or his followers to, or, well, they've just he blindly think that he knows what he's talking about. So. That he expects a Christian or a weak Christ, weekly Christian audience to be able to connect with. Right. He's providing the familiar for a familiar framework that he can then build his concepts on because. His audience is not uh, savvy enough uh, or discipled enough to know what these terms really mean. Mm. So then, so he just keeps repeating the same stuff. You know, I was wrecked with his love for man. So the first thing he showed me was how much he hated to see us in these bodies. Now, here's the Gnosticism coming in. It was like his children yeah, had cancer. There it is, right there. And he would do anything to heal us, us of it. in these bodies. Why? Right. Because he believes that, that, that the flesh is evil. Right. That's Gnosticism. And he wants to Where see us back God in the body created for us, the, the glorified body. 
Yeah. Whereas was yeah. God created us to be embodied beings. Yeah. But then again, too, so, here, we're going to have to ask also, what does he mean by the glorified body? Hmm. What does that mean? There's a slipperiness here in his writing where he's going to use terms without full definitions. And I can already see this uh, happening already. So if he's not defining his terms, he can redefine them any way he wants. Well, I've... You've, um... accepted, you've accepted in reading this, you've already sort of bought into the framework. Now all he has to do is build on the framework. Mm -hmm. On some of his YouTube clips I've been watching... Uh, he says that Adam and Eve's body bef before the fall, they were glorified, and then he goes, uh, if a nuclear bomb exploded, th their bodies would not be affected by it. Um, if you know, if they got shot, they they would not be affected by it. And I'm thinking, so you're taking thermodynamics of our reality, <laughs> and somehow it's that so-called glorified, the theosis state of that glorified body is still within the thermodynamic framework of our reality being tested or something like like anyway that but that's his perception he thinks a glorified body is like some marvel you know having thor's lightning or like you know uh some some superpower and mm -hmm. uh yeah is that also gnosticism that did the did the gnostics sort of like go down that weird no, they didn't Super quite go powerful. down that weird road because they just wanted to abandon the flesh. So I see. your ancient Gnostics wouldn't have, have cried out for a glorified body because that would have been abhorrent. Resurrection was ab abhorrent to, to Gnostics. Because it's your original body coming back. Yeah. That's the, that's it's the, the flesh. Christian belief. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so far, everything else has been just pure Gnostic. Okay. This is probably his one deviation from that. That doesn't make him mm. any less Gnostic. It just... <laughs> <laughs> I firmly believe he's making a whole, you know, a brand new religion. So then... Um... No, he's recycling an old one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what well, invents uh... something new you can go with what's tried and true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, he keeps talking about, like, you know, while he was flying from the United States to Belgium, I feel that love wave crashing over me, you know, uh, you know, if we created a great classroom, so we see nothing else in life that equates to him, if we create a great classroom, the earth to open the eyes of humanity, everyone else, everyone is in, cl in class already, but they, but do they see? Uh, I understand why Yeshua says, you will forsake all, it is not because he requires it, it is because we become so consumed to know him more, that we can do nothing but drop everything else to follow him, I cannot imagine ever being separate from his great love. You know, it just goes on and on with his love, love, love. It's kind of like the Passion Translation, yeah. you know, Brian Simmons on the, on the like, in the preface of the Passion Translation, it says, Terrible fall translation. in love with God all over again. Yeah. It's like the same, you know. Well, you know, yeah. um, the Passion Translation has a methodology very, very similar to Michael Petros. Right. I mean, the Passion Translation was not translated by a Greek and Hebrew scholar. Mm. It, the guy who translated that has no knowledge of ancient languages. Yep. He got his translation from divine revelation. Right. Who does that remind you of? <laughs> exactly. You know, the guy who said he, uh, you know, did the Passion Translation, you know, received angelic visitor, visitors. Right. And Petra's made the same argument. Brian Simmons yeah. said, I had angelic visitors come to me yeah. and, and download new information for this yeah. Passion Translation. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. and it's a, it's, it's a train wreck of a translation. Yeah. It's a train wreck. In this statement over here, I find it curious. He's like, I'm so addicted to his presence that I feel as if I can never get enough. I know that those who also understand and had that great love, and he, spe he specifically takes out particular individuals, Enoch and Elijah, and others. 
were just one day consumed by that love and he had had to take them because they were just too heartbroken to not be in his presence. But... Okay, there's no evidence of others. <laughs> He's picking two very, very particular characters here. Mm. Ones that didn't die. Enoch and Elijah did not die. They were taken up to heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, they're unique. They are special. Not everyone, in fact, I'd say no one else, has that qualification. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, Enoch and Elijah did not die. You know, the Bible is pretty clear that this is these were absolute unique circumstances. Mm. <clears throat> so, you know, I don't know how he can sort of just get the idea that those two are going to be the same as, you know, his burning passion, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, not on the same level. Right. If a fiery chariot takes him up to heaven, well, then maybe I'll change my mind. But uh, <laughs> I doubt that's going to happen. Just a thought. Right. Because those were bodily trans, you know, removals. Those weren't just spiritual. You know, in the case of Enoch and Elijah, their body was taken up. Can I just show why I think this is this is so significant here this this may be information okay. for you uh, so so that's so that's your reaction as far as like those terms go but it's this particular individual uh, uh can you see this is this coming up yeah yeah william branham he his book and petro keeps talking about this guy consistently and even has his his book to buy on his website it's this particular guy um, claimed to be a prophet with the anointing of Elisha, Elijah, who had come to herald Christ's second coming. And obviously, you know, he's been labeled as a doomsday cult. And apparently um, on his grave, on Branham's grave, um, he has like, uh, I don't know if it's mentioned here, but basically... He, he is of the Laodicean age, basically. Like, he's like Branham is like the last of the so called Elijah prophets to arrive. Um, and then, and then anyone who follows his work after or, or continues his work after will sort of bring in. Ah, here it is. Um, so, Branham's servants deferred, and he described his own characteristics as attributes of the Laodicean church age messenger. But Branham believed the age would immediately precede the rapture. And Branham explained the latest in age would be immoral in a way comparable anyway. But the point is, Petro then continues to speak about, you know, they, they, they seem to equate the seven seals and hence like the sevenfold ministry or something. And, and then mm -hmm. this like seven Elijahs to come. And so it's, yeah. it's, it it's, it's all under this context as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hyper dispensationalism. Right. So, um, yeah, okay, to come back to his... Oh, there we go, let's come back to that. So, um, okay, so it's just interesting, like, with those who don't really realize why he picks on these particular names, mm -hmm. it's because there's a lot deeper, you know, yeah. deeper stuff going on than... It's, you, it's uh, loaded. You know, it's loaded. It's a loaded word, yeah. 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 It's, 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 it, they're loaded names. Yeah. You know, they're, they're names that connote things that are, go well beyond just what he's saying yeah and he might be relying on that so now that that's over and done with i know you're going to absolutely enjoy this next bit enjoy this a is a subjective term this is <laughs> this is <laughs> this is when i i don't know if you remember that super chat i sent you but but out yeah. of the blue you you were like Wh whose book did you buy <laughs> who is this <laughs> Uh, who is this? <laughs> Whose book did you buy? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> uh, I don't know whose book this is, but wow, that, um, 
No. Uh... <laughs> this is the this is the bit I copied and pasted. So he goes, the declaration that the church has left its first love, revelations plural, should be a sounding oh, alarm. Dear, if, if if you're writing a book on the Bible, if you if you spell that out, revelations instead of in the singular. That just shows how ignorant you are right out of the gate, you know. And not just that, but first it love has nothing to do with of John. Right. And first love has everything to do with orthopraxy, not orthodoxy. That's yeah. what the, that's what the Ephesian church problem was. They yeah. they were so focused on correct doctrine that they forgot correct like like practical stuff, you know. Yeah. So anyway, so it has left its first love should be a sounding alarm that has left the foundational hidden teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of the early church. The early church teachings hidden are based... Teachings. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, now there's some loaded Gnostic language. The hidden knowledge, the hidden secrets. Every Gnostic cult from, say, the 3rd century BC onward always promised his followers to provide the secret teachings, the secret knowledge that provides salvation. This is the core of Gnosticism. And it's really mm -hmm. what separates Gnosticism and Christianity forever. Gnosticism says you can be saved by what you know. To teach you the hidden teachings we're going to teach you. Christianity is always going to say, you're not saved by what you know, but who you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's just that. That's a uh, hidden teachings. That's that's a buzzword for secret knowledge, salvific secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you'll find it all the way back. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll go. You that that stretches back two millennia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then he's like. Apparently, this is the teaching of the early church, very audacious claim. The early church teachings are based on the parabolic and prophetic understanding of the Torah, and much of this understanding is lost today. So much of God's word and doctrine is lost in translation that without returning to the Hebrew roots, there is difficulty to recover the original meaning of scripture. Even the name Jesus, derived from the Greek name Jesus, no, it Hail doesn't. Zeus. No, it doesn't. Is this, is this, this, is not, this is not even contested. And there's, there's, there's no controversy there at all. <laughs> yeah, no. It is, it is, it, it, it comes from um, Jesus, um, and it's, and it's not even Jesus. It's Jesus. Um, hmm. it, 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 which becomes uh, Jesus in the Latin, Jesus in the Latin. Uh, but uh, it comes from uh, Yahushua. Which, or Joshua, Yahweh saves, mm -hmm. and and I see here he says, he sa Yahweh is salvation. No, it's Yahweh saves. Mm. It's a theophoric uh, name. And Yeshua is not a Hebrew word, either. He says a no, Hebrew isn't. language. It's it's no. an Aramaic word, right? Yeah, it's an Aramaic. Yeah. It's an Aramaic derivation of Yahushua. Yep. Which also again means Yahweh saves. It's, it just yeah. doesn't mean salvation. Yeah. 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 Um, and then he's like, the Torah is a book of secrets and mysteries that are hidden in parables. God speaks in parables and dark sayings. And Yehoshua taught the the masses in parables. Um, and uh, the hidden teachings of the kingdom that take us beyond the veil and in the Holy of Holies considered by the early church to be the Garden of Eden, the original dwelling place of the first high priest Adam. The church has strayed from the the church has strayed from the early church teaching that the temple is a pattern of all creation with three sections of the temple, the outer court, holy place, and holy of holies, to pick diff different levels of understanding of God's word, his prophetic structure his prophetic scriptures. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a leap. Um okay. I mean, he, it, it's like he, he gets it part, there's, he got it part way correct. I mean, the, the um, early church did teach that the temple was a pattern of creation. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fair, absolutely. Um, 
it isn't though it isn't the outer part the holy part and the holy of holies the holy place and the holy of holies were within the same compartment there's an outer court an inner court and then the holy place that's how the temple is laid out mm-hmm. and within the holy place is the holy of holies okay mm. and that's because people were separated according to uh, where their position was like for example you had the the outer court was the court of the women the inner court is the court of the men the holy place is where the priests priests could go mm-hmm. okay but they don't this does not depict different understandings of god's word that's just grafting an unrelated concept onto that teaching Mm-hmm. And that teaching is essentially that Jesus Christ passed through all the courts to the Holy of Holies to pay the ultimate price and to bring salvation back out. Mm-hmm. We had the whole, all of that, all those, all those parameters. Mm-hmm. In Hebrews 10, through his flesh, we are able to yeah. pass through. His flesh is the veil by which we pass through. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a Hebrews understanding, and that's what the um, early church is is portraying, is mm-hmm. that that basically that Hebrews understanding that Christ is better than the temple. Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Basically, um, the book of Hebrews tra- uh, basically uh, transmits two uh, or transmits two major concepts. The first is how one can apostasy. Okay, which is a terrifying concept all on its own. I won't get into that because it's the other concept that the church fathers are really emphasizing here, which is that Christ is better than X. Mm. And X can be Moses. You know, there's going to be a passage uh, that talks about, you know, um, um, the angels in chapter one. You know, to which of the angels did he say, you are my son, bow down and worship him. Exactly. Yep. So, you know, Christ is better than the angels. And then mm-hmm. later on, it's going to be Christ is better than Moses. And then it's going to be Christ is better than the temple. Mm-hmm. So that's what the early church is trying to teach here, is that Christ is supreme in all things. And Christ is supreme in the uh, over the temple because he could enter the temple and be our intercessor to the most holy place so that we no longer need an intercessor. Christ is it is all in all. Mm. Uh, and hence that phrase, Christ is all. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so he's he's, he's mm. off the mark here. He's very much off the mark because he's he's reading something that the biblical writers are not importing here. I would say this is an this is a sign just to sort of fill you in on this um because i've spoken to with margaret barker I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with margaret barker but she's like a second temple jewish scholar i think and yeah i'm more she's late age a... oh right okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm not i'm not as up on my second temple authors as i am on my uh, bronze age authors because that's more or, less, more or less what i do yeah i do late bronze age work but she she's probably the only scholar he's consulted like like actually you know contacted to sort yeah. of verify and i phoned her twice now the first time was more like hey margaret i've read your works only now i'm calling you out of the blue because i'm getting involved with petro and what's your thoughts and she's like no i don't endorse much of his work um but whatever she endorses is stuff like this because you know in the moment like for example you said oh well, hang on there was some truth to this Mm-hmm. But it's actually from Margaret Barker's book, because Margaret Barker makes the argument that from the from Solomon's Sea all the way into the Holy of Holies, it's sort mm-hmm. of like the three tiered co- uh, universe. In, it is, yeah. You know, because you're starting with Sheol. It is a recapitulation of nature of the universe. And then you, and then even the colors change, like from mm-hmm. from a red uh, to a blue. Um, you know the sky, like the sky or something, and mm-hmm. and um, well, it, yeah. the temples had a cosmographic function. 
Mm. They were a recapitulation of the created order. And this is this is ubiquitous across all temples of the ancient Near East. You know, you go down to Egypt, you look at their temples, you know, on the outer courts, you're going to find domestic life scenes. You're going to find domestic life scenes, you're going to find um, rituals being carried out. When you get into the inner court, you're going to start seeing stellar scenes where the holy items are being handled. You're going to see stars on the on, on the roof of the temple. Mm. And then you're going to get into the the holy of holy areas, and then it's going to be nothing but the sacred. Mm. So all temples in the ancient Near mm. East had a cosmographic function. And, and the temple in Jerusalem, it's, not, it's not unique to Israelite theology. Yeah. But that's going to be very, very different than saying that the cosmographic function depicts different levels of understanding exactly. of God's work. Exactly, yep. So Nailed he's taking a half-truth to give you a whole lie. Mm-hmm. And, and and also as an Egyptologist, I you know I just want not only the VH members to know this, but also just people in general. It's not like, say, the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, this is your entire dissertation. It's not like the mm -hmm. Ark of the Covenant and the Temple are just suddenly like unique uh, designs out of the oh, blue no. that has no association with with. It's it's all because, for example, you know the seals, right? Like. Yeah, like Hezekiah see like it has a lot of Egyptian elements yeah. to it. Like the uh, maybe, winged water disc with the two onks. Maybe if you can spend like two, three minutes just giving like a very brief chronological sort of like summary of what I just said with that, because that's okay. your work and that. Okay, yeah. well, um, with regards to suggest so the the Hezekiah seal, um, mm -hmm. the Hezekiah seal uh, essentially uses um, Egyptian symbols, you know, symbols that are distinctly Egyptian. It has in its center a sun disk with wings. Now, mm -hmm. in Egypt, we call this the wajit disk. And it represented a um, solar snake manifestation of the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was considered to be a divine symbol. The onks are the Egyptian symbol of life. Yep. So Hezekiah's royal seal had these uh, Egyptian symbols. And much of what we see in Israelite uh, uh, temple iconography and tabernacle iconography um, is derived from uh, Egyptian iconography. So like, for example, on the Ark of the Covenant, we find, say, the two cherubim facing each other with wings stretched forth. We mm -hmm. find very, very similar iconography on, say, the sacred barks of Amenhotep III, the coffin of King Tut, um, the coffin of Horemheb, uh, lots of those, say, late New Kingdom kings, then extends into, say, Dynasty 19 as well. I'm just going to share graphics here so that people are aware of what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's Hezekiah's... Um... Yeah, so we see on the one on the mm. on the left here, we see um, the solar disk with the two wings and an onk on the right and a partial onk on the left. Mm. Oh, you do see the uh, the keper uh, uh, in that middle seal there too. Now, there's that also has Egyptian iconography. The keper is say, um, and the keper there is actually holding a solar disk. Mm -hmm. This is this is the manifestation of creation. Okay, and it's a very very common placeholder for the sun god. Yep. Now we have to understand that these symbols, while they originate from Egypt, that they also are being used for Yahweh worship. They're being repurposed. They're not pagan. They are just a common symbol that's common in the culture that is being used for. Um, um, or or repurposed for Yahweh your worship. So the, this one also this is Uzziah. This is Uzziah's seal. There's your there's the wings there. Mm -hmm. um, Two solar discs. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me go back to that. Sorry. Um, oh, that's okay. There we go. Yeah. So there's yeah, that. There's two two yeah. uh, watch it uh, discs essentially. So. Yeah. And then this one is this is Jotham and Ahaz or Ahaz, kings of Judah. Mm -hmm. um, Four discs in the center. Two Uraeus goddesses. Mm -hmm. So these are the cobra goddesses that protect the 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 solar disc by spitting out flames of fire. Now, this is an analogous symbol that the Egyptians would have used for say ser what the Hebrews uh connote as seraphim. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's actually three Uraeus on that uh cuz there's two on the top of the hem hem crown and then there's the uh, two at the bottom that are dangling down. Mm -hmm. And it has the horns of of Amun there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a symbol that's borrowed off of from Amun Re. Ah, interesting. Okay, yeah. Okay, because the horns are the ram's horns. Ram's horns are symbols of Amun, Sun Discus Re, the Hem Hem Crown. <laughs> it's from. Right. Is, this is a borrowed from Amun Re. Right. Right. And then finally, here is a chronological over overlap. Just you know, once because I'm reading a dissertation here. Um, mm -hmm. at my my friend Ben Stanhope. This is his dissertation. Okay. He did. Yeah, and so, I know Ben. So he's yeah. He basically at you know in conclusion he's like, look, here's sort of like, you know, chronologically through the periods, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, this this is the sort of thing. People like. You know, Doctor Fork, Stan, like, like just just in reflection now with respect to Petro, if Petro legitimately was engaging, like if he actually got an actual doctorate, he claims to be a doctorate in biblical studies and all, like he should be aware at least. He should be like engaging the secondary literature, instead of just throwing all these fanciful like ideas, like what you just saw in his introduction. Um, you know, it's this sort of thing that sort of like frustrates me that, like, no one that I've corresponded with from WOH are even aware of, you know, stuff like that. Um, well, why would they be when a perfectly good assertion works every time? <laughs> As you said in that uh, in that uh, that super chat, I think absolutely brilliantly you said um, a, a good story sells or something. I think was your the phrase. The best you... story wins. Yeah. Best story always wins. Um, I hate to say this, but Gnosticism isn't dead. Gnosticism is just as much a threat today as it was in the first century. And it's just as much a threat for the, essentially the same reasons, which is biblical in, uh, ignorance, failure to catechize people in the church, essentially discipleship. We don't do discipleship in the church. And the fact is that, that Gnostics tell a good story, and we like a good story. Gnostics are incredibly good storytellers. And... Storytelling catechetizes. It disciples. But if, if, if the only way we are discipling is through stories, we are really not teaching people the way they should be taught. We're not teaching them to think logically, doctrinally, scripturally. Oh my gosh. Reading the Bible in its context? That's crazy talk. It's, it's, it's crazy talk today. When you can just entertain them and give them a good story. You know. This is the terrifying age we live in today. It's an absolutely terrifying age. Because we, we, we live in an age where the best story wins. And the best story all too often is leading people to destruction. It has real serious spiritual consequences. Doesn't matter if it's a true story. The oh, yes. Yeah, no, it sounds... Yeah, you, you said it You said it like... Yeah, something to do with like... If you package a story well enough for something and it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. People will believe okay. a story. Yeah. 
and because and top... we are wired to accept narrative. We're we're accept mm. we're we're wired to to believe stories. This is why fiction has such great traction in our culture. Mm. Because fiction entertainment catechizes. So all you have to do is present something in a story format for people to buy it. And then that's how and cults sort of grow mm -hmm. or, or cults um, thrive in, in, yeah. in that context. Yeah. And say what you will about Gnostics. They're incredibly good storytellers. That's the one. That's the phrase. They're incredibly good storytellers. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's the phrase I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so all of this is not original to Israel or Israelite theology. It's like, you know, the holy place, you know, nope, um, no, this is the original. tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, because your dissertation was uh, highlighting it's it's a piece of furniture, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the war camp is again, because, mm -hmm. you know, the pharaohs, their, their war camps are very similar. Here's, a, here's another one. Again, this is something that's not an unseen realm. We didn't even get into this on the podcast, but it's just fascinating. The tabernacle procession, scholars have noticed, is actually sort of laid out. Even the tabernacle itself and, and, and you know, the way it, it moves and so on and so forth. It's laid out in the formation of a war camp. And of course, God is the warrior here. Remember Exodus 15.3? The Lord is a man of war. The angel is leading the procession to Canaan. It seems very logical that the, the, the whole complex would be laid out like a war camp. And scholars have noticed this. And they've also noticed that, you know, the tabernacle actually has some differences with the temple in the way it's, it's laid out. Now, those two observations taken together, I want to show you some things. Here's the tabernacle. And it's a very familiar, you know, picture. We, if you're a you know, Bible student, you know, the basic, you know, outline structure of the tabernacle. You see the, the holy place with the two compartments. The one in the back is, you know, the, the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's way back, you know, to the left here, upper left-hand corner of your screen. Holy of holies, and then you have the rest of the holy place. And you've got a few objects, you know, for, there's the, you've got the brazen altar, so on and so forth, slaughtering tables and whatnot. You've got this big court. Now, if you look at the temple next to it, yeah, it's got you know, the holy place, and that has two compartments, Ark of the Covenant and all that. But the front here doesn't have a lot of this stuff in it. And, of course, when you get to the temple, you don't have camped around the temple the tribes of Israel. So there, there are some visual sort of layout differences between the two. I mean, they're, they're both, you know, the dwelling place of God and they're both decorated like Eden and, you know, they're both, you know, refer, you know, the Mount Zion, the cosmic mountain, Mount Sinai, where the tabernacle sits for a while, where it gets, where it gets constructed, uh, you know, for the first time, so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of similarities, obviously, but there are some differences. And scholars have, have noted the differences and said, you know, if you look at the tabernacle, especially when the people are camped around it, it's kind of like a war camp. And that would make sense because Yahweh is the divine warrior. Well, other scholars have noticed, you know, that war camp is laid out pretty much exactly like the war camp of Ramses II. Now, I don't, I don't want to get into necessarily the date of the Exodus, but this is really interesting. The war camp of Ramses II is known more predominantly because there's so many depictions of, of it and of Ramses. So other pharaohs could have laid out their war camp the same way, but Ramses II is just the best and you know, convenient example. And he happens to be one of the pharaoh candidates for one view of when the Exodus happened. So re regardless of whether you, know, you like that chronology or a different one, don't worry about it. Just think about the camp. Think about pharaoh's war camp. Here's tabernacle. Here's a schematic, a little drawing here. You'll notice here at the top, Ramses II's war camp. And I'm going to show you actual pictures of this in a moment, you know, paint, paintings of it. You've got this outer perimeter, 
You've got an entryway, a long entryway, like a hallway, just a long entryway here in a courtyard. And you've got a reception tent where you've got royal officials, you know, people who are intermediaries between visitors and, and Pharaoh. And then you have Pharaoh's chamber. Look at the tabernacle. You've got the entrance. You, know, you walk straight forward here. You get the holy tent, the holy place. The holy of holies is right here. And even in the temple, you've got some sense of this, at least sort of this, this linear structure. Here's a, a painting of Ramses' war camp. You'll notice, again, you've got this entryway right here. There's an opening. You go down the corridor and you hit again, where he has his attendants. And then in the inner sanctum is where the Pharaoh is or, or you know, a symbol of the Pharaoh or the Pharaoh's deity or whatever it is. You know, it, it would depend on the occasion really. But isn't that interesting? You know, what's, what's more than it just being sort of an oddity, interesting, is which warrior wins? Which one wins? You know, it, it's just another way where the Exodus narrative and the whole deliverance from Egypt is designed to establish the superiority of Yahweh over the gods of Egypt. Remember, Pharaoh was considered Horus incarnate. He's considered a deity figure. And Pharaoh's going to go out to war to get those nasty Israelites at the Red Sea. Not really. Okay, we know who wins the conflict. And again, to, to sort of just dig or to reinforce the concept. When the tabernacle is constructed and God instructs the people how to camp around it, it tells everyone, including the nations around Israel that know what's going on here, that this people is migrating from Egypt you know, to somewhere. You know, ultimately, they figure it out to Canaan. Their divine warrior really is. <laughs> he really is one. You know, he's... He's defeated the gods of Egypt and Pharaoh. So it's just more theological messaging. As a highlight, again, if it does, regardless of whether it's Ramses or not, but this is a good argument for the historicity of the tabernacle. Yeah. Then Petra goes, it is in the Holy of Holies that the glory of God resides, and it is only accessed through revelation and apocalypse or a removal of the veil. When Yeshua told his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. He's speaking about being outside of the veil leading into the Holy of Holies. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sort of mixing your, uh, your, your verses here. Uh, uh, Judas hung himself. Go forth and do likewise. Right. Yeah, you know, you can yeah. you can rip out all sorts of stuff out of context and and just come up with some really really uh, amazing uh, pronouncements, and that's that's sort of what he's doing here. And and just to, again to clarify, in Mark four eleven, it's Jesus actually explains this mystery. He says, "Look, mm -hmm. it's like a mustard seed," and using using uh, a mm -hmm. colloquial term of the day, like the smallest of all seeds that becomes into this gigantic tree and how ironic that culture even in jesus day knew it's impossible for a mustard seed to become a world tree in mm -hmm. ancient near eastern you know that 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 cosmic tree motif right yeah. because because jesus is depending on like daniel 4 and ezekiel 31 with this imagery that the kingdom of god is such that it's starting as small as a mustard seed Mm -hmm. And the mystery is how it becomes the cosmic tree. Yeah. And sure enough, it starts with 12, 3,000 at Pentecost, and then by by the 3rd, 4th century, the whole the Roman Empire becomes Christian. Yeah. It's in the millions. You see, yeah. that is the context. Of, that, in other words, that saying became true. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with 
he was speaking about being outside of the veil leading into the Holy of Holies in this verse. It, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. 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 And then, and then, and then maybe in conclusion, because I don't want to take too much of your time, but like, he then, he seems to harp on a lot with 1 Corinthians 2. And maybe if you can, um, uh, I'll bring up Logos and we can sort of like, comment on that sure. but he's, he, he says upon seeing the symbolism throughout the scripture do we do we begin to recognize the hidden wisdom that not only paul wrote about which is the verse i'll show in a moment but also all the early church fathers wrote about when we begin to recognize the hidden meanings within the word of yahweh we begin to experience ascension and illumination that the early church taught occurred uh, when one learned the secrets of the kingdom the cry for us to return to our first love is a cry to return to righteousness the right understanding of Torah, which encompasses learning the hidden mysteries and transform life. So literally in, in Petra's ideology here, it's once you know the secrets and the mysteries, that is salvation, which is contrary to the gospel. Yes, it is. Um, okay, now, and then he's like, look, the purpose of this book is to remove the veils that have been covering many eyes. And it's, uh, in my opinion, it's nothing but, no, it's just, you're just trying to like, have people follow your eisegetical method uh, that's that's really all of it yeah it's essentially um, redefining the core concepts of the bible yeah that's really what he's doing okay now in conclusion here is the relevant verse from first corinthians all right so uh, finally, uh, so Paul's like, you know, he just wants to know nothing but Jesus crucified and, you know, uh, my, my message preaching was not by human wisdom, but by God's power. This is a very yeah. like Corinthian thing, right? And then he does something quite interesting. He goes, when we are among mature people, we do not, we, we do speak a wisdom, a message of wisdom, but not the wisdom of this world or of the rulers of this world who are passing up the scene. So this this last bit, this rulers of this world who are passing mm -hmm. the scene is an interesting phrase. It is an interesting and then, phrase. And then Petro doesn't quote verse 8. He only stops with verse 7. So he goes, instead we speak about God's wisdom in a hidden secret, that musterion word, right? Mm -hmm. Which God destined before the world began for our glory. And he just, and then Petro just stops here. Yeah. But he doesn't continue on and understands that none of the archons of this world, right? understood it because if they had they would not have crucified jesus yes so is in a nutshell what what is going on here especially in the greek it's I'll spiritual it rulers now. it's princes of darkness especially the, the the demonic powers uh i'll bring up the greek interlinear here we go Here's your Mysterion over here. Mm -hmm. And then here's your four old names. Mysterion. Well, let's talk about Mysterion for a moment, too, because that's actually a very interesting term, too. Yep. Go for um, it. You know, we, we often translate it as, as mystery, but that mm -hmm. really actually doesn't quite convey the sense of Mysterion. Um, sort of a better way to to think about it is paradox mm. okay it's, in fact it's, that that would fit the context there hence the human wisdom versus god's right yeah. because it is it's, it's more along the yeah. lines of paradox than than say a right. mystery it's not right. something that's unknown it's something that's more ooh unfathomable awe-inspiring you know how does this all work it's not and hidden. And Satan didn't know the plan, because if he it's, did, he wouldn't have killed it's, Jesus. It's in, it's in yeah. plain sight. You're right. Mysterions are in plain sight. There's nothing mm. hidden about them. There's nothing because, hidden about mm. a mysterion. Mm. It's, 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 it's like, um, like a, say, a, say, a mystery of nature or a paradox. Mm more than anything else could it also be something like you know in I, and i always use this analogy 
Daniel Craig's Bond in, in Casino Royale. So mm -hmm. he's betrayed the first time around. That's why he loses the game in the first time. But then the second time he trusts no one, which mm -hmm. is again a biblical phrase like God doesn't even trust his holy ones, right? Mm -hmm. So Dan so Craig's Bond then plays it very carefully where Le Chief thinks he can still win the second time. But Dan Craig does a, like a Mysterion moment where he's able to just have that edge and then he wins the poker game. No, no, I don't like, think it's quite like that. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's just take, for example, the Mysterion of the, of the Ecclesia, the church. Okay. Where, it's, where, where it talks about the church being made of individual members. Now, we're, we're, we're talking here about a first century understanding of biology. <laughs> when it relates the body of Christ to a physical right. body. Right. We have these hands. We have feet. We have eyes. We have ears. We mm -hmm. have all these different parts. And they're all separate parts. But they're all united in purpose and function. Mm. Hence the paradoxical nature of the paradox how this nature works simultaneously. of the human body right. is mm. being applied to how the paradox mm. nature of the christian church mm. where christ is the head mm. and each of us is a part of his body the body of christ right and yet we're all working for the common purpose of christ mm for the kingdom so yeah. so that's what's really being meant here by mysterion everyone can see it it's open for public view it shouldn't work but somehow it does mm. things like the trinity mm -hmm. in, in a hypostasis the the, the, uh, hypostasis the book of revelation right. uses the mystery babylon the mysterion babylon right and and multiple kingdoms simultaneously mm -hmm. being that that, right, right. The mystery of the great, great whore Babylon. Mm -hmm. Right. The great betrayal, the apostasy. The the essentially the the Church of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. where it is meant to be something that shouldn't work. It shouldn't be working because it's a it's 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 a betrayal of everything. Hmm. And yet this is something that is working in plain open view for the purposes of darkness. Right. Is, is he, um, cause I've seen graphics as well. I think he uses Kabbalistic graphics or something. It's really weird because Possibly. when you're talking about body, you know, body imagery, uh, I haven't seen this graphic. Graphics. There's this graphic where he has Jesus' head in the Holy of Holies, his right hand having the menorah, his left hand having the showbread, then his feet at Solomon's Sea. Like, in other words, he structured Jesus' body with the with the so-called levels of, say, the temple itself. Is that even? That's that's obviously. I I I've never come across any scholar or anyone. Well, I haven't seen that. I haven't yeah. seen that. Um, I can't comment unless I see it. Yeah. I might recognize it if I see it, but if but until I see it, I don't know. Sure. Uh, okay, I think this this should suffice. Any um, maybe like closing comments on uh, I don't know, or even uh, no, I'm good. encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh look, I mean, if, if if you're into the stuff, it's just going to end you in in tears. It's going to end in tears because. Gnosticism never ends well. Mm. It never ends well. Because it becomes a vicious cycle of knowing more knowledge. Getting in deeper. You know, there's no freedom here. Mm -hmm. There's no freedom from bondage. You, you, it's, you, 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 it's, you still feel like there's not enough, there's not enough. You have to keep yeah, trying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Never, mm -hmm. the, the, here's the problem with Gnosticism and all Gnostic systems. Is... Yeah, it'll give you a short-term uh, feeling of superiority. Well, I know the secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is, well, you need more secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. And it builds on itself. Oh, you've passed the first level. Well, 
congratulations. Now you have to go to the second level. Mm. And then third level, fourth level, fifth level knowledge, deeper knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge. It's never enough. Mm. It's never enough. There's no and if, assurance. If, and if you back away, I'm sending you to hell. You're going to hell. Right. You've denied the knowledge. Even though you've got, you've gone, you've come through so many hoops so far. Yeah. One slip up, up, oh, start again. <laughs> There's no end to it. There's no end to right. it. There's no yeah. assurance of salvation. Because it's yeah. not from Jesus Christ. It's not from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus told us that, you know, his burden is light and his load is easy. Yep. He gives us freedom, freedom from our sins and assurance of salvation. And it's a finished work. Yep. It's a finished work and it comes through relationship, not knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. You are God most welcome. You. God bless you also. Yeah. Okay, my next guest is James McGrath. Now, James is an interesting one. He's, again, another New Testament sort of second temple historical jesus early church sort of scholar um some of his books are directly right in line with that context and um um and one one of his latest books that i've recently bought is uh what did jesus learn from women but uh, otherwise he's he's like as you can see here he's worked on uh, on monotheism in second temple judaism and so on so he's he's again one of the scholars that you know i just pulled in a lot of these scholars an email sent them an email james was gracious enough to respond and say yep let's do this and again um just like folk prior uh james has a lot of um gracious christian uh you know encouragements uh, on how to engage cults like voice of healing i hope you enjoy all right hey folks it's rob and i'm here with dr james mcgrath how are you doing james i'm doing just fine rob how are you i'm doing just fine on this fine evening <laughs> and it's morning for you yeah uh thanks so much for doing this uh james could you give a brief introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm a, a religion scholar. I am the Clarence L. Goodman Chair in New Testament Language and Literature at Butler University. And uh, New Testament, early Christianity is my main field. But uh, some people may know that I also do things related to the intersection of religion and science fiction. I uh, have done work on the Mandaeans, which is uh, an ancient Gnostic group that's managed to survive in very small numbers down to the present day. And so do a whole array of different things, but uh, New Testament biblical studies is where I started and uh, what the one thing I've consistently done throughout my, my academic career so far. Nice. So you, you, in other words, your research encompasses basically Gnostic, you know, Gnostic yeah. uh, studies and, and that ancient group and all that. It, it does. In fact, I, I've mm -hmm. been doing some work that I think, you know, can contribute to our understanding of a sort of where Gnosticism comes from, like how it emerges. But uh, that's still a work in progress. I've, there, mm. there are a couple of YouTube videos floating around where I've talked with some people about that uh, <laughs> and uh, recording of a conference paper, but uh, that's still in the early stages. And so it's much more ideas that need to be put in print with a lot of footnotes and a lot of discussion of the primary mm. sources. Mm. Uh, but but there's, there's something of a mystery to how this phenomenon emerges because suddenly it's it seems to be popping up all over the place, right? Uh, once we get into the era of the early church, suddenly they're interacting with these these figures and seem to encounter them in Egypt, in Rome, in various places. And so figuring out how far back they go and what leads to this particular form of religiosity is is itself an interesting question. Very good. And also for anyone out there, uh... I think one of my favorite pieces of work to date that you've done is the is the the book that that's titled um, "What Did Jesus Learn from Women." That is uh, 
you know, the title sounds a little bit, uh, you know, like, wait, what? What did he learn from Moon? But trust me, if you give it a read, it's there's a lot of gems in that book. So I appreciate your work in that as well. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you do need at least a slightly provocative title in order to get people to <laughs> take a look. Yeah. Uh, I've been a little bit disappointed that I haven't had as many people, you know, nobody's banned it, which I'm sure would have bumped up the sales a bit. Uh, you mm, know, if somebody yeah. had, uh, you know, staged a burning or something like that. So clearly the contents actually are not as controversial as the title might lead one to, to expect. But right. yeah, maybe sometime we can, I'll, I'll come back and uh, we can talk about the book. Definitely, definitely. But you've got a more pressing concern at the moment. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right now we're going to be reviewing Michael Petra's preface of his book, Access Behind the Veil. And yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like read snippets of, of the preface and feel free to react when necessary. So, all right, this is how it starts. So this book is based on a number of the many revelatory teachings given to me straight from God. After many years of hearing and preaching sermons relaying that God's grace covers all sin and that one day a group of believers would be caught up into heaven, avoid massive destruction of the world, I was taken through the veil and he began to reveal the hidden secrets of the kingdom as taught by the early church. All of my Christian doctrine leading up to this point went out the window. Since this awakening, I have never been the same. This complete alteration and the existence of this book all started with an impregnation of new DNA. Yeah. And so maybe yeah. maybe it's going to take it paragraph by paragraph. I, yes. I was tempted to interrupt you after that first line, <laughs> uh, just oh, right. because right. Yeah. yeah, one thing that ought to give us you know, some some serious humility, uh, if if one is open to the possibility of having a religious experience that might you know, change your life and uh, lead you in interesting directions. It's this emphasis on it's like revelatory teachings given to me straight from God. And it's one thing to affirm that that's a possibility. It's another thing to claim that whether you've heard a voice, had a dream, had some kind of experience, have a sense that you have been granted insight, to claim that that's straight from God, how, how does one know that, right? People who claim this sort of thing regularly disagree with other people who claim the exact same thing. And the truth is that even if we read the, uh, the prophets of ancient Israel, we read you know, the letters of Paul, uh, who had religious experiences of his own, we get a sense that you know, on the one hand, each of them has their own style. And so revelation doesn't override uh, you know, the, human, the human personality and persona and things like that. And on the other hand, Paul regularly says, you know, this, you know, I, I believe I have the spirit of God and I'm offering my own judgment here. But you know, the, the apostles, you know, Paul and Peter disagreed once, right? There's that incident that's narrated in, in Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so if people who knew Jesus, and presumably if anyone was going to get revelatory teachings straight from God, it would be them, needed to work things out and have a, have a, have a serious dose of humility as followers of Jesus, to start in this way and saying, okay, straight from God to me, and now I'm giving it straight to you. Uh, really, is is doing something that goes, yeah. It, it lacks all of that humility and that recognition of the capacity for human beings, even those who are diligently seeking God, to be wrong, to be mistaken, uh, to misperceive. And so that lack of humility, um, it, it fits his statement that all of the Christian doctrine he had learned went out the window. But yeah, I think what that really means, even though it's not what he meant by it, is that, you know, the teaching of Jesus <laughs> has gone out the window by the sound of it. So I, I was, mm -hmm. I, I had some concerns right from the first, uh, from the first sentence. Mm -hmm. Oh, he, yeah, you know, this is, this is now speaking a little bit beyond the book because I've, you know, I've, I've, uh, digested quite a bit of material on Office YouTube and other like, um, uh, let's just say like live streams that he's done uh, like he's like he, he he's spoken to I think it's like a Spanish congregation where he has like a translator and so on and yeah he uh, let's just say dive, just goes way down into the the cringe of like conspiracy theories anti-vax I'm I'm a, I'm a prophet that that predicted COVID I'm this and that and then and then when I when I see um, 
you know, all my Christian doctrine going out the window. I've actually heard him say things like, if you're a Protestant, Catholic, Eastern, Orthodox, whatever, the point is the Jesus of those traditions um, is not the true Jesus. And so in, it, it's, it, it's, it's not just maybe he's just written this sort of like in a, in a hyperbolic sense. N no, no, no. Uh, this is a uh, very deliberate, like this is something I've noticed. And, and maybe as we, as we'll keep reading through, he, th there's a very deliberate choice of certain words and terms and the way he structures the sentences to, to make a point that later on, if you're a member in this, in this cult, you'll start to sort of like reaffirm exactly what he says. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and yeah, um, but I, that's the concerns I had with, yeah. you know, when I first read this as well, I, I'm reading this the first time going, hang on, maybe get some things or maybe go down the weird path, like later on in the book, not right in the preface, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so that your reaction and my reaction is very similar in that sense. Um, and that, clearly that yeah. last sentence is leading somewhere that we will, uh, this impregnation. Of, let, it, yeah, let you read a yeah. little bit more before we talk about that. <laughs> so. Right. Right. So this, this next paragraph, I don't need to read because he's giving an analogy of his parents and how he's like, my grandfather's DNA wasn't me, but then he goes and says, okay, God has made me recognize something tremendously important about genetics and DNA. Yeshua states that the seed is the word and in his word contains the mysteries of the kingdom. The seed, which also means sperm or the DNA of my grandpa Yorhe Vavhe, has the power to create universes. I see my mind constantly being impregnated with the seed of creation. Okay, All right, so James. What's Yahweh is the grandfather. <laughs> uh, so is it like there's grand, grandpa, Yahweh, and then father Jesus, and then him? Is that basically his system? I honestly, I, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where he's getting grandpa from. It's... Uh, but I do think he, I wonder if, if, because, because I've seen him teach on say first John three, I think it is that speaks about, we are the, we are the sperma of God. And then he gives these wild analogies that, that somehow in a, in an actual genetic and sexual sense, God formed Jesus's body in Mary's womb. And now if, if you somehow veer into like a Gnostic sort of way of thinking, think, think gospel of Thomas, think, you know, women have to become men if, in order for that salvation to occur. And there's, there's a, there's a metamorphosis, like a transformation that in other words, this fleshy body is, is, is removed. And then, and then we, we attain the glorified body, which is still somehow genetically connected to the to our grandfather which is you know Yahweh or something it's it's like this weird convoluted big sexual thing he even he even says things like we need to make love to our creator we need mm -hmm. to be making Jesus is our lover God is our lover um, and he'll he'll take uh, the pictograph stuff like you know I don't know if you know about Jeff Benner's work which is totally pseudo scholarship but he takes the ancient hebrew paleographic you know the pictographic meanings yeah. and like for example the, the hebrew word shemem he'll take that to mean oh see the the last consonant looks like a sperm and the middle consonant looks like water so it's like liquid sperm you know it's it 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 goes it, it goes into bizarro land very quickly so when you ask the question what what does he mean by grandpa here that that's my best explanation based on what i've heard or you know have have heard him explain in the, in these sort of like roundabout ways yeah um, and i mean yeah. there are there are enough problems with with all of that that, that all of that. keep us yeah. keep us busy talking yeah. for a while yeah um yeah i know your plan is to do one video with uh, a bunch of scholars but i imagine you may yeah. find yourself with <laughs> A lot of separate videos, right. and you'll just uh, run with these yeah, yeah. because, although we yeah. may end up saying a lot of the same things, but yeah. I think you know. So one thing I, I do want to talk about, you know, um, seed, you know, sperm, you know, Greek words and things mm -hmm. like that. Go for it. Uh, talk for about it. Gnosticism. 
But mm-hmm. this this misuse of you know, Greek and Hebrew letters and alphabets and things like that, as though they're a code, or as though they're pictographs that can you can look at and say this looks like that. So the meaning is, I think it just shows that people are reading the text in translation. They have a sense that there is, you know, they're vaguely aware that there's this underlying text that's in other language, other alphabets. If they knew more than one language or they knew their own language or understood how languages work, they would understand that this just doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if you were to say that, you know, well, the letter A in English, right, looks like an upward arrow, but then the crossbar does, it's, when you write the letter A in English, you don't mean any of that, right? And somebody could come along and take what you wrote and say, okay, this letter looks like that. And therefore the meaning is such and such, but it would have nothing to do with what you intended when you wrote a word, right? That's not how languages work. Uh, We don't treat letters as symbols, unless, you know, maybe the one exception is if we're doing some marketing logo design, right? And then you you do something creative with with letters Mm -hmm. in that context. And so that simply isn't the way to get it. Like like in a Catholic, you know, you know the 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 Christos, you know the the the, yeah. the X shape with the sure. P looking symbol, like like that's yeah a shortened form of Christ, you know Christos, right? Right, so, and they make it as an yeah. abbreviation and they use it that way, but it's mm-hmm. not as though you know, you can take the fact that let's say in English X marks the spot and you know what where our mind goes with a certain shape and then say mm-hmm. and so they're showing that this is where you should look for and then. You know, the, the row indicates, and you know, we can say that looks like a sperm too, right? If you're inclined to see sperm in places, <laughs> uh, right. yeah, people, yeah. people who are looking for sperm can find them all over the place, but mm. uh, I don't recommend that as a way of understanding texts. Mm. So, yeah, that, and, and uh, one thing you'll get when people take that approach, you'll find that they also take a similar approach to the Bible, and it's, it's one that has a, a long history, but that doesn't make it less problematic. And I'm referring to the uh, penchant for allegorizing. You know, so taking a text and looking at, okay, it uses this word and this word also means this and this word also occurs in this story. And so this is a picture of this. And then here, this also connects with that. And there, and what the story actually was, what the text was actually saying has gone out the window. And that can be a creative undertaking to to find new meanings in text but it's not about what it's not about what the bible says right and so you could do that with any text you wanted to and so once again right when he says you know his christian doctrine that he had up until that point has gone out the window right the bible the meaning of the bible is going out the window and is what's being substituted is something that's being imported through this creative approach Mm, and so the question that people need to ask themselves is if it's not the meaning of the biblical text, it's something that's being imported, why should you trust this individual to import meaning into the text? And is it just the fact that he says that he's got this straight from God? Well, why what he says he's got straight from God and not what other people who make the same claim say that contradicts him? And exactly. so I think people, yeah. you know, people, there, there is a, a, a subculture in Christianity, particularly in um, some of the more conservative branches of Christianity, that you ought to be part of a minority that's going against the flow, that's holding to the truth against the majority that opposes it. And yet, what sometimes happens, particularly in Protestant circles, is that people get into smaller and smaller subgroups because the the subgroup of the denomination that broke away in order to preserve the truth then becomes a you know, the majority context of one's own church or denomination. And so now you've got to look for something else that will set you apart from them. And <laughs> there's there's a drive in that direction mm. that mm. in some ways is a drive towards heresy. Right? Mm. So. Mm. Very good. Yeah. I, and I think, yeah, I think you nailed it with, you know, that, that like right off the bat, the fact that he starts by saying all of this goes out the window in that sense, he's being honest, yeah. <laughs> because then yeah. when you compare it with mainstream Christian scholarship, which he claims to be of the devil, so I kid you not, he's yeah. called me, everyone that I've interviewed on my channel, as of the devil and of the the beast system, 
only he is the uh, the 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 means by which you go back to traditional Christianity in the first so apparently he he's the one going back to the first 300 years because apparently after 325 AD after Nicaea suddenly the church apostatized and then lost these mysteries um, but uh, he doesn't seem to realize that he and as you as you carefully qualified it there's a pseudo gnostic uh, ironic co uh, he doesn't seem to realize that he's regurgitating in his own way a form of you know second third century gnosticism yeah so, and i'd like um, to talk about yeah. talk about gnosticism a bit yeah go for it uh, go for but it. i think yeah. another thing place where he's you know teachers like this you know on the one hand need to offer something new so that you feel like they're you know they've they're worth listening to instead of various others but on the other hand they need to sort of tie in to or connect with something that exists at least at least a desire right or a penchant you know within uh, christian circles and so within protestantism right there was this reaction against the the church that was felt to have drifted from the teaching of jesus and the apostles and so there's a let's get back to the the original because we've departed from it and then you get historians coming in and saying, you know, well, even that doesn't go far enough because you know, Jesus was already being interpreted and reinterpreted in the earliest texts we have. And so we need to ask, you know, challenging questions of those. And each of those, you're right, you can, you can take that or leave it, right? You can, you know, I we don't want to get sidetracked into that. Oh, definitely but no. to yeah. say that, mm. okay, so everybody else got it wrong. And now I'm coming along and revealing the truth because I got it direct from God. Is not doing what either of those things was doing, right? I mean, there's no anchoring in the Bible. There's no anchoring in historical method. There, the only so-called anchor isn't an anchor at all. It's his claim that he has received revelation, and there are people who sit, you know, online. And since you mentioned that he's connecting with people who do, you know, conspiracy theories and things like that, one of their slogans is "Do your own research," and mm -hmm. usually what that means is right, Google it and find people that you then trust mm -hmm. instead yeah. of either the experts or the authorities in traditional Christianity or whoever it might be. It's not as though you are going into a lab and researching the thing. It's not as though the people who are following him like have done things with Hebrew linguistics or anything like that. And so are, are doing their own research in the real meaning of that term, right? They are choosing to trust people. And so, if you decide to trust someone, right, that's you, obviously you're free to do so, right? I'm not uh, suggesting that people aren't ultimately free. But my point is that people often give away their trust rather cheaply and uh, give it to people without without asking, does this person deserve my trust? And if so, why? How do I determine that? The, cre the creative ability to read things into the Bible that aren't there, that's actually a skill that lots and lots of people have. And so uh, that doesn't set this this one particular case apart. <laughs> I, especially, you know, just to give a, a more humorous touch on that last point, something like, you know, the pirate translation. Oh, like, or, or, you know, there's, there's just translations just for the sake of like, in a humorous sense, like, like, you know, like the Genesis 1-1 and, and how a pirate would speak it, you know. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying, like, like that, that is the wonder of, of the human imagination. Uh, yeah. We have the power to do this, but then the scientific method, as you're pointing out, is the reason why Christian Europe, you know, with the with the emergence of the scientific method, it's it's to filter out that 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 subconscious sort of bias that automatically creeps in, um, because you don't you're not trying to prove your conclusion, you're trying to disprove it. That's the Popper method, and if you disprove something, then Obviously, it's not true. But if if you can't, it's like oh, then you know something's there, and you keep vetting it out, and then peer review plays on top of that, and yeah, yeah. And for those, you know, I, I suspect that many of the people who are on board with this particular individual's teaching may not be uh, enamored enamored with uh, or the scientific method, or immediately embrace your uh, advocacy of it. But I often say, you know, it's it's really you know for, within a Christian framework apply the golden rule, right? Treat the, the, the arguments of others the way you'd want your own to be treated. And if you treat the views of others with skepticism, then apply that to your own as well, right? Uh, many people think that faith is 
believe in, you know, without evidence or even in spite of evidence, in spite of what you see, in spite of something. But ultimately, one thing that there is consistent uh, emphasis of, on through the Bible, through the church fathers and ancient Christian sources down to the present day is that there are people who teach falsehood about God and about Jesus. And that seems to be one thing that everybody agrees on. And so, I mean, from my perspective, I think faith should mean you take God and Jesus so seriously, talking about Christian faith in this context, that you really look into things enough to make sure you're not being deceived, right? Uh, that's how you take take your faith seriously. It's not that you you believe because if you don't happen to trust unquestioningly the, the person who has the truth, then uh, you're going to get sent to hell. Um, it sounds like this person is, is threatening to do that and claiming he has he has the keys and can throw people in there. But yeah, there's, <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time I read, you know, like two or three paragraphs or something and found this much that was disturbing at this, to this degree in such a short space. It really is right. quite mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue quickly into uh, the next couple of paragraphs. So, yeah, I see my mind constantly being impregnated with the seed of creation. Then he's, you know, he elaborates about many times, grandpa has taken me into his glory where I've seen many wonderful, exciting things. He's seen the healing of deaf ears, blind eyes, raising the dead. He basically he's limitless in his ability. Um, then he goes, uh, the entire universe is only an afterthought. Afterthought. His true heart is to have us come back into our destiny of restoring the earth. Then one morning he showed me his aga, his love, his agape love, or agape love, and I couldn't contain it. I wasn't ready for it. Again, found myself with grandpa's thoughts. It was overwhelming. Again, going back, and then. Maybe I'll, I'll, I can pause over here and you can make a comment, but he's like, the first thing he showed me was how much he hated to see us in these bodies. It was like his children had cancer and he would do anything to heal us of it. He wants to see us back in the body he created for us, the glorified body. Now, since you yeah. are an expert in the Gnostic sense, is this verbatim Gnosticism or is it a very weird, like, like, like a, like a, I don't know, like like a tweaked version of Gnosticism? Like what, right. what, what's your reaction to this? Yeah, and well, I, I yeah. approach this because when you use the term Gnosticism, you, you're probably aware, and I'm sure a lot of people are aware that uh, there are some people who will stick the label Gnostic on on anything that is, is, is weird yeah. and disturbing, you know, and things like yeah. that, uh, or anything that claims to have secret teaching, right? But esoteric, uh, esotericism, the idea that there's secret teaching, secret knowledge, uh, is much broader than the uh, ancient religious tradition known as Gnosticism. This sounds pretty close. Uh, so one of the things that's characteristic of the the range of different sort of religious viewpoints that nonetheless get placed under the umbrella of Gnosticism in uh, the early church are groups that essentially separate the, the, the supreme god from the creator of the material world. And that's one of the distinctive features that uh, creation, physical creation, is the work of an inferior being, often referred to as a demiurge, right? One who, a being that creates the physical because they're lacking in the kind of skill and wisdom that the Supreme God has. So it's an offshoot of, at, and quite distantly removed from the, the one Supreme God. And this actually sounds like it's at least veering in that direction. I don't know where he thinks the physical body comes from. He talks in a way that Gnostics wouldn't have of restoring the earth, but it sounds like at least at, you know, at times it sounds like he's talking about remaking the world in a way that the church always had, although he may mean something very, very different by it. But there are other places where it sounds like he is veering in the direction of, of Gnosticism, but which even some more mainstream uh, trajectories in Christianity did, which was that salvation is about escape from the world which God created. And so I'm not sure how he fits some of the things that he said already in these sentences together, but he clearly has a negative view of material existence. And on the one mm -hmm. hand, seems to take it further than most mainstream Christians would. On the other hand, is tying in with 
a trajectory in Christianity. Like most Christians don't talk about resurrection, new heavens and new earth, uh, talk about going to heaven when they die and uh, are not worried about anything else. And so there is a negative view of, of, of creation that has crept in that Gnostics just took that and took it to a, to a further extreme as it were. So I need to, I need to know more about where he goes with, you know, what he says about the origin of these bodies that he doesn't think God wants people to be in. But there, there's certainly a Gnostic tendency uh, at the very least. So um, mm -hmm. at, I'm not sure I have any qualms about your use of that <laughs> word in relation to this, because right. uh, mm -hmm. th th that could be where he's headed with us. Uh, and also to fill you in on any like missing data points, um, because he doesn't really say it here in the preface, but he does say that Let's just say he doesn't even use the term dominion theology, but he does. But in essence, it is dominion, dominionism uh, from that again that new apostolic reformation cultic way of thinking, where he'll say that the the Greek word apocaly for apocalypse, right? You know, say revelation, it means to be removing the veil, and and then he'll say something like it has nothing to do with eschaton stuff. It's all to do with this mental veil which if you want to go into the absolute like 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 the nth degree of what this quote-unquote veil is it's this entire body which will then become uh it'll go back to its original state which is what apparently adam and eve had which is this godlike divine superpower body and i kid you not i've heard him give analogies like imagine if this super the super being think i don't know think dragon ball z <laughs> the best thing i can think of is a super saiyan sort of like glowing hair and an aura around and you know it's it's this and he says look imagine if like a nuclear bomb were to explode next to you it wouldn't it wouldn't affect you whatsoever and here i'm thinking wow you actually equate theosis and deification you know and you seem to equate it with some form of like continued thermodynamic sort of existence with our reality but in a very like ubermensch sort of way uh that that's what he means by glorified body by the way um in this sense fascinating yeah um yeah yeah i think yeah you know, so one one challenge that it's one of the reasons why i i do the diverse things i do uh it's all sort of driven by a a, a, a theological interest as well as an intellectual interest in the fact that the early Christians viewed the cosmos, you know, viewed uh, the body in ways that you know, are not precisely those that modern science uh, provides us with. Right? I, they weren't, no, nobody, no biblical author writes about galaxies and supernovas and uh, things that you can <laughs> exactly, only see yeah. with the help of equipment that didn't exist then. Uh, Paul talks about the heart as the the place where cognition happens and we can we can we can embrace that just fine as a metaphor but ancient people didn't know it was a metaphor yet right and, and there the were debates in the Paul's time. yeah and yeah. so the question of how you translate some of the you know how you translate the gospel essentially how you translate the message of jesus and the teaching of, of christianity for people who inhabit a different worldview that's informed by science is a challenging one and some people have gone the route I think they they rarely put it in those terms, but they give the impression that you know the sinful nature is means you know it's basically like a genetic defect, right? And so, if that's what you're implying by your doctrine of sin, then you're you're setting yourself up for somebody to come along and offer to to provide you with gene therapy that will cure you of it or something like that. Exactly. And so, mm. so there's. This is a very strange uh, wedding of scientific language and you know ancient uh, mystical esoteric ideas, but there there are things in you know, there are things in more mainstream Christianity that I think when we don't do, well, maybe I'll put it this way when the mainstream church that is is trying to be true to the teaching of Jesus, uh, however much we may disagree with one another across some uh, boundaries of denominations and things like that. But those who are at least seeking that, when we don't do a good job of helping people navigate how to relate uh, 
these texts that reflect you know ancient language ancient ways of putting things to their contemporary faith then other people are going to swoop in and you know, blow people's minds maybe literally but uh, at least metaphorically with things that sound like oh so that's how you do it um we, we, we need we need to do better so that people don't find things like this plausible because uh, mm. there there isn't anything plausible here. But it's tying into something that um, a more mainstream trajectory in Christianity may have led people to be open to. Mm -hmm. Just and just to I don't know if you've if you noticed this, but notice a moment ago what you to just to translate what you're saying. He's being anachronistic because. He clearly is anachronistic in the earlier paragraph where he talks about the, the, the sporos in Luke 8, 11, which Matthew does use sperma in Matthew 13. But the point is the fact that Luke says sporos. This is all agricultural terms, not actual, you know, the gamete sex cell that, that you know, the sperm that men produce. But he's like, look, the seed, which also means sperm or the DNA, well, that is an anachronistic import yeah. into um, into that term, which, which as you're pointing out, Matthew and Luke would not have known, because in those parables, Jesus is using, you know, the seed of the kingdom, which is like some seed fell on rocky soil, or some seed fell on the some seed fell on that, uh, to then import some form of English and and 20th century biochemical terminology back into Koine Greek is uh <laughs> that's one have a you, you mean to tell me that God for all eternity that's actually his main language is uh you know the oxyribos sort of like terminologies like like before Hebrew and Greek is even written down like that's originally how we used to speak and then only then in the 20th century does it do we rediscover those or original terms like yeah, that you see, that's that's what was flowing through my mind, um, you know. Yeah. Also, when I was reading this, yeah. yeah. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Well, yeah. yeah, being being in the United States, I will tell you that you know one reason why uh, there's this whole stream of you know, sort of end times theology that connects it with things that are going on in the world in the present time, and sort of reinterprets Revelation in some very um, dubious ways, is the conviction that you know. Uh, basically the united states must be part of this you know this is if this is about the end then it must you know the united states has to feature because we're 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 central to everything right there's this ego mm -hmm. uh that a lot of american christians then get on board with but it's reflective not just of american ego you know sort of uh uh nationalism and things like that but the penchant that i think everyone has to assume that we're somehow the the measure of things and central to things and that, you know, the Bible is, it's about us, it's for us, it's to us. And we need to not breeze past those, those first lines of the letters of Paul. It, what he wrote to the Corinthians may be relevant for us, but these are not letters to us, right? And if we want to make sense of them, the first step should be placing them in their ancient context. And that means not reading DNA into them, not doing those kinds of things. And so, yeah, there's, you know, there's a problem with this. I think there's, there's perhaps a useful analogy that can be made, right? Because I, in addition to the the various other things I do, one of the groups with fringe online views that I've interacted with are the uh, so-called Jesus mythicists who mm -hmm. deny that there was a historical yeah. Jesus. And it's right. interesting that, you know, Richard Carrier also says, you know, so the, the seed, when it says that right. Jesus is of the seed of David, <laughs> like, you know, well, you know, the, the Greek word, it's, you know, sperma, so, and we get sperm for that, and so, you know, it, it probably means that God had a, sort of a heavenly sperm bank that, mm. yeah, so had Davidic seeds stored up, and so could make a heavenly being that was uh, made using David's sperm, and so that, yeah. you know, this doesn't require historical Jesus, and you know, on one level, that's no, no less bizarre than this, but <laughs> if you think if you think one of these right. is bizarre and the other makes sense, then I would just encourage you to ask yourself why, right? Because both mm -hmm. of these are reading the fact that ultimately 
we get our Greek, our I'm sorry, our English word sperm from a Greek word into the Greek, a Greek text in which the ancient word is used. And if we think about the fact that English has changed over the centuries and over the millennia, the meaning of a Greek word is not the meaning necessarily the same as the meaning of an English word that derives from that Greek word, right? Mm -hmm. Just as words in Greek, right? Modern Greek is not the same as ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. And so that's just not the way you interpret texts, right? It just doesn't, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. Uh, linguistically, one has to be approaching things differently in a way that asks, what, what's the meaning of this word in this time period? What's the range of mm -hmm. meaning? What is what's the what are the connotations? What are the nuances? Uh, to the extent that we can figure that out across our distance from those times, in um, you know, and from our own mm -hmm. vantage point. Mm -hmm. And again, and then just two minutes uh, to translate what you're saying, and then we'll get back to maybe the final paragraphs that yeah. that's relevant for the review. Um, yeah. You know, in uh, eschatological discussions, you know, like in Ezekiel when it talks about Rosh, all that that's to do with Russia. You know the whole Gog Magog thing, but again, like for example, Heiser has written on this, and he's mm -hmm. he's like, I love this analogy he, he gives. It's like, look, you can take the Hebrew word Yam, and you can take the English word Yam. <laughs> One means water, and the other means an edible plant. Like, you know, they're totally different words. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it looks the same and even sounds the same even in english lead and lead you know yeah like one means mm -hmm. you know element and period table element yeah. uh, elements and one means like a like a verb or you know like bleeding and yeah so yeah i um, love puns you know by all means make puns but mm. you know making a pun is not the same thing as interpreting a, a text and asking what is this yeah. about and so the fact that it you know there's a word in there i mean there was the whole you know um so Satan fall like lightning from heaven and people trying to say, yeah, so there's, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's a reference to Barack Obama. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yeah. It really isn't. Um, yeah. yeah. People, people look for hidden meanings. And another thing that is, you know, I think is a worrying trend in this, that that is another indication that not just historic Christian doctrine, but the teaching of Jesus, the core teaching of Jesus is going out the window is that there's this focus on finding esoteric truth or being in a minority that knows the truth so that you can be, you know, boast essentially in your rightness over against the multitude who are wrong. And one thing that doesn't foster is humility, right? The mindset of uh, those who would be greatest, you know, making themselves a servant of all. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. it, you know, in, in this, it's, it's a way of substituting rightness for humility, uh, for living in the way that Jesus taught us, following in his footsteps. Uh, having the mind of Christ, when Paul talked about that in Philippians 2, it doesn't lead to having the mind of Christ and knowing all the secrets that he knew. It's humbling himself, right? Being a servant, being willing to die. Uh, in obedience to God and for the sake of others. And so it's at that core level. It's at the, the point of the most fundamental central uh, aspect of Christianity, which is who Jesus was, right? As a lived, uh, you know, the lived human life, right? That was perceptible to everyone, right? Not, not seeing behind the veil to deeper theological truths, but just what was there perceptible was the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and calling those who mm, follow him to follow cool. on that path on the way of the cross. Mm. That's what this approach and other approaches like it to Christianity are, are demolishing are undermining are leading people away from. And that's, mm. I think an important point that needs to be emphasized. And, and, and that, yeah, beautifully stated because that there's a simultaneous notion of servanthood, you know, to be an Aved, right? Like that common Christy hymn in Philippians 2, like to, to be like a slave in that incarnation. But also, how ironic, that is the scientific method. It, you know, that that same humility trans, uh, follows through in that whole renewing of the mind in Romans 12. And, and you know, uh, 
if you if you if you you, you can't just make assertions. You you have to uh, be humble enough to agree. Yes, I was wrong. Let's improve. You know, and you keep pushing forward. So yeah. 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 And you and I both know that scientists and other academics don't always do that uh, consistently. <laughs> but well, the yeah. When greed's right. in the way. Yeah. But the academic enterprise is one of you know, on the one hand, trying to stand on the shoulders of others and see a little bit further, push the boundaries of exactly. our knowledge a bit deeper, yeah. a bit further. And yet, by participating in the process, setting yourself up to be critiqued by others, right? And so mm -hmm. often we'll propose something and it may not change the consensus because others will respond and we'll show that we're wrong. Uh, and mm -hmm. we may not be humble enough to accept the critique, but the wider academic community will, will see that uh, our claim has been given a an adequate response, and we'll we'll follow uh, we'll follow the evidence on the whole where it where it leads. And so it's it's that communal mm -hmm. effort, right? And so whenever any one person says, you know, just listen to me, right, and ignore everybody else, um, it's it's dangerous. You know, it it doesn't work in terms of you know whether you're doing science, history, or the Christian faith. Uh, there is a communal aspect to it. And when we shut ourselves off from community, uh, we're just making it more likely that we'll be wrong on our own. In our, con in our closing comments, uh, just a couple more paragraphs specifically in his introduction, he then says the following. The declaration that the church has left its first love, and he says revelations plural, <laughs> Which, yeah. which, by the way, that's not a typo. He actually says this con consistently. He yeah. mispronounces yeah. words. Like, like instead of saying anathema, he says anathema. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying the didache, he'll say the didachi or the uh, I, I, some some other term. But yeah. you know, and it, it, the the point is, this is not typo. This is literal. Right. This is literally how he mm -hmm. talks and writes. Yeah, and um, let me just say, I've yeah. I've sometimes pointed out to people who are inclined mm -hmm. to like trust Dan Brown, right, as a source for church history and things like that. So in um, Angels and Demons, he wants to make a reference to the Book of Judges, but he calls it the Book of Judgments. Like he gets, <laughs> and what I tell people okay, about yeah. Dan Brown, I'll also tell them about, um, about this. If you can't get the name of the book that's in big, you know, often all capital Caps, letters right yeah. there at the top, mm -hmm. right, the easiest thing to get right, if you can't get that right, how likely is it that this person is accurately explaining the contents of that book, the title mm -hmm. of which they can't even remember. I didn't know that, by the way. That's that's yeah. nice to me. That's great. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's been fixed in later editions of it, but I remember reading yeah. it and thinking, hmm, I think oh, I he, can use that as an illustration. I do I do know he's finally admitted it's all work, work of fiction, because before when it was first published, it was yeah. like, this is a work of nonfiction. Yeah. And even Gnostic scholars were like, no, you know, yeah. yeah. So then... Um, so the declaration that the church has left its first love should be a sounding alarm that it has left the foundational hidden teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of the early church. And just a quick comment, my, in my personal, because I've written on Revelation uh, a couple of years ago for my local study group, and my understanding of Ephesus in chapter 2 is that the first love here is not about its, its beliefs and its doctrine. It's rather about its orthopraxy, its, it, you know, its right practice. Yes, they, they were so fixated on it, the right doctrine that they forgot their first love, which is, you know, love your neighbor, love this, you know. Um, yeah. So that's my reaction to that sentence over there. Yeah. yeah. And as I was just saying a moment ago, it, this this teaching emphasis on, you know, get knowing hidden teachings is leading people away from what Jesus said was of paramount importance, love for God and love mm -hmm. for neighbor. And so yeah. it's ironic that he's quoting... Uh, well, without getting the title of the book correct, uh, you know, referring to some language that's found in the book of Revelation and yet doing precisely the thing that it's warning about. Mm, mm. Uh, and we could talk at length about yeah, the whole yeah. approach to the book of Revelation that turns it into a, a, a sick prank against the early church, you know, where it's sent, it's sent to them, right? And it's like to the church in Ephesus, but it's not really for them. It's actually about your time reading it you know, in the 21st <laughs> yeah, century. Exactly. Um, yeah. There's a problem there. Right. Because I'm I'm a partial preterist, and so I believe Revelation is like a Roman polemic and all that stuff, but yeah. Yeah. It's It's got at um, least an initial mm. meaning, right, that's relevant mm. and intelligible to the recipients. So. Yeah. 
So then he goes, the early church teachings are based on the parabolic and prophetic understanding of the Torah, and, must, and much of this understanding is lost today. So much of God's word and doctrine is lost in translation that without returning to the Hebrew roots, there is difficulty to recover the original meaning of scripture. Even the name Jesus, now I, I can't wait to see your reactions to this. Even the name Jesus derived from the Greek name Jesus, Hail Zeus, is a serious divergence from his name in the original Hebrew language, Yehoshua, Yahweh Salvation, or Yeshua Salvation. This is just somebody saying, this sounds like this, and... I mean, the truth is that if if writing Jesus, right, which was just the way that, that was the, the Greek name that was used as the equivalent of Yehoshua, Joshua, right? I mean, we, we get it in, you know, we get it in Greek translations of the Jewish scriptures, but we get it all throughout the New Testament, right? And so if writing that name in Greek is wrong, then all the New Testament authors, when they refer to Jesus, are doing this thing that is a serious divergence. And so you should, you're saying that the New Testament text should be thrown out. They represent a serious divergence from an underlying truth. And if that's your view, right, if you're happy to throw out, as again, he said in his first paragraph, throw out all things Christian, you're throwing out, he, he's saying you should be throwing out the New Testament in its entirety. Right? It's <laughs> exactly. all about Jesus using this name, which doesn't mean Hail Zeus. Uh, it just sounds like that to this particular modern English speaker. And so either throw out the New Testament and any claim that you have any connection with Jesus, because if, if you're throwing out our earliest sources, then all you have is whatever you imagine. And mm -hmm. there's no, there are no constraints on your imagination. If you're not willing to throw out the New Testament, then throw out this uh, teaching that is telling you that the New Testament has, you know, it, itself represents a serious divergence from Jesus' original teaching. That's or even throughout the patristics, because you have Latin and Greek. Some patristic writers sometimes should have gone, hey guys, you know, don't, don't you realize it, it means hail Zeus? Like, because <laughs> they're using Zeus all over the place in the anti-Nicene and post-Nicene. And, but, but also just to quickly tell this to you, James, um, Petro teaches his congregation that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew and Greek was a was a demonic attack against the New Testament. I kid you not. He actually and did teaches he claim that, that he has the original Hebrew, which nobody else has. And and not only that, but he he forgets to realize that Yeshua is an Aramaic word, not Hebrew. And Aram, Aram, you, I mean, Mark and studies show, and I think you've done, I think you've done scholarship in, in specifically in Mark, haven't you? Like, like in Mark and scholarship, Mark has a lot of Aramaisms in it. Mm. Uh, obviously, he's writing in Greek, but he has to translate certain terms for the sake of his Greek audience, right? Yeah. Like Thali uh, Takum, uh, yeah. you know, little lamb rise, like you know, so. Yeah, so what, what Petra yeah. is doing here is clearly say, just giving himself a, an, a way of saying, okay, when the New Testament doesn't seem to be saying what I'm saying, it's because the New Testament distorted, right? The Greek New Testament distorted. And so he's basically thrown out the one thing that could be the last anchor against, you know, or the last, um, you know, means of testing. Does this, you know, is this true to Jesus? Right. If you can't trust the New Testament, you have to trust what this person says was behind the New Testament. Then you're basically trusting this person over against every other Christian voice throughout history, including mm -hmm. the the original apostles. Right. And if the original apostles got things badly wrong, then that means that this particular self-proclaimed apostle could get things badly wrong, too. And if they right. didn't, then you should be checking this person who's saying he's an apostle over against them. The, the two apostles. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's self-contradictory yeah. to, to, to get on board with this sort of thing. And hopefully people can see that. And then finally, um, these last two paragraphs, um, he goes, The Torah is a book of secrets and mysteries that are hidden in parables. God speaks in parables and dark sayings, and Yehoshua taught the masses in parables. The hidden teachings of the kingdom take us beyond the veil in the Holy of Holies, considered by the early church to be the Garden of Eden, the original dwelling place of the first high priest, Adam, 
the church has strayed away from the early church teaching that the temple is a pattern of all creation where the three sections of the temple the outer court holy place and holy of holies depict different levels of understanding of god's word his prophetic scriptures until we begin to see his word from a spiritual and prophetic rather than a natural and literal point of view we have not yet gone through the veil into the holy of holies so what so just quickly to translate this last bit what he'll say is everything in this entire 15 minutes we've been discussing all of that, that we've discussed is nothing but the natural and literal or or sometimes he'll, he'll use the term you're going by the dead letter of mm -hmm. of academics and scholarship you need to go into the mystical like what's undergirding the text to see this whole other universe of meaning which is what he's meaning in this last sentence yeah and that's yeah. that's really about you know the 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 long history of allegorical interpretation and there there is a long history of that right you get philo of alexandria right in judaism um you know oregon and alexandria was a was a a place where this thrived and i think the key thing to say about it is that there have been lots of different allegories of the same text because when you allegorize you are not talking about what the text says you are exploring a way that the text can become or be understood as a symbol of something else but that meaning is not in the text right that is something that you you create right as an interpreter of the text and there are pretty much endless ways that one can do it uh, not necessarily and not literally endless in the sense that Sometimes the text does push back at you and just doesn't work as an effective allegory. But ultimately, there are seemingly limitless things that one could read into a text if one is willing to say, well, this is not this. This is just a symbol of that. And so it's, it's, a, it's a creative, it's not discovering the deeper meaning of the texts. It's figuring out how to do creative things with the text. Mm -hmm. Can you make a, give a final word on, say, like a, an encouragement and also recommendation on how to push the patristics, especially someone like Oregon, whom he mispronounces as Origin. But, you know, when you're reading these patristic writers, for example, Oregon of Alexandria, right? Like, there's Alexandrian schools of thought. You know, when you look at when you look at East West Christianity as the gospel spreads through the known Mediterranean region, uh, there's a certain time and place and context as you progress late first century, second and third onwards, where you have to like what you're saying, read the read say the biblical books in in context. You have to read the patristics in that same context, right? So, yeah, I would is, just say, do we take Oregon word for word, or like how do we approach someone like him? Yeah, I, the Things, there are older translations like the Anti-Nicene Fathers that are in the public domain and you can find them online. And mm -hmm. so if, you know, if Petro is saying that he's offering a secret teaching that, you know, there, it was there, you know, prior to Nicaea and you find it in people like um, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, uh, others of that sort of Alexandrian school of thought mm -hmm. and of interpretation, I would just encourage people to go read those sources. Uh, they they sometimes do get sort of mystical and theological and obscure, but I think anyone who reads them, like takes the time to actually read them, will see that they're not saying the same things that uh, this book that, that we've been talking about are is saying. Right. And so, I think I think people can you know if they're willing to take the time to check this, and I think was it Jerome who who asked the question? You know who who could ever read all that Oregon wrote? I mean he wrote a lot, mm. right? And so, mm. right. but. I don't think you'd have to read mm -hmm. much of what he does and how he interprets texts in order to get the sense of the fact that there may be a superficial similarity in approach, looking mm -hmm. for deeper me layers of meaning and finding not that there's a literal and a spiritual, but also finding mm -hmm. serious differences, both in the sense that Oregon said that you know, the literal is there and it's, you know, it's not unimportant. It's just not, um, you're not done with mm. what the text can do or say at that level, mm. but also that the specific interpretations are are different point by point. And mm. I think the maybe the best response, the best way to do this is take take your spiritual health, your need not to 
give credence to false teachers seriously enough that you read these texts, you read the book of Revelation and <laughs> notice that he gets the title wrong and then see that he also gets the interpretation of it wrong. But if you're inclined to look for different, deeper meaning beyond that, and so don't trust the New Testament in the form that we have it anymore, then he's also appealing to other ancient Christian writers. Read those. And mm. if the people he says agree with him don't agree with him, then you're being lied to. And I think that hopefully will settle the matter for at least some people who mm. take their spiritual well-being well enough to investigate this. And that's my prayer uh, for any of the members that might be listening to this, as well as the ex-members that are looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, James. Uh, blessings to you. Yeah, and you. Uh, I look forward to further interaction on, uh, you know, the other books that you've written on and, in, in, you know, outside this context. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time on this. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been good talking to you. And here is my next guest, Ian Paul. Um, how I came across Ian was because when I was writing my Revelation commentary back in in uh, 2018 and basically also 2019, uh, Tyndale was going through their second batch of uh, revised and in fact totally uh, reformulated and, and totally refreshed commentary commentaries on, on its on its well acclaimed uh, you know, uh, Tyndale commentary series. So, um, I came across Ian Paul's Revelation commentary, and it's just one of those gems that, because the Tyndale commentary series is is meant to to be lightweight, but at the same time just packed with just the latest scholarship, and but 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 in lightweight form, like kind of like no beating around the bush. It's it is what it is. Here you go, bang. And and in Paul's you know writing style is really refreshing as well. So yeah, he was again another my go-to uh, scholar to to contact um, because he specializes in that particular book. And uh, what's curious is that uh, because Petro likes to quote from Revelation a lot, and he likes to talk about the you know the unveiling, you know removing the veil, right? So this is a vital opportunity to see how a scholar with respect to Revelation, how he interacts and, and, and reacts to uh, what Petra has to say. So I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> no, hey folks, it's Rob, uh, and I'm here with Ian Paul. How are you doing, Ian? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. That's good. Um, Ian, uh, who are you? Uh, I live in Nottingham in the UK. Um, I'm originally a mathematician. I studied maths at Oxford and applied maths in Southampton, and I worked in business for a while. Then uh, I'd sense God was calling me to ordain ministry, so I studied theology in Nottingham. I did a PhD. I did a PhD on um, the philosophy of language and the interpretation of the book of Revelation, looking at a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, and then and Revela and, and the book of Revelation, chapters 12 and 13 particularly. Um, I was, I'm ordained in the Church of England, um, and um, but I've been in church leadership, but I've also spent considerable time in theological education. So I was the academic dean of one of the largest Church of England colleges for just under 10 years. Um, and I'm currently full time writing, speaking. I write a blog, um, which is quite well known at this side of the world. And um, I also write textbooks and popular books as well. Awesome. At Hey, a mathematician with respect to the Bible, you go, now. There you go, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I'm also in that sort of context. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Um, well, Ian, thank you for doing this. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read uh, some, some paragraphs from Michael yeah. Petro's Access Behind the Veil. Mm. And this is uh, nothing but a vetting process where I want just your raw reaction based on each mm, paragraph. Sure. So... So here we go. What's your thoughts? Okay, well, um, I, I think I'd say that some of the things he says are uh, have, have some basis. Um, but and, and I think a lot of things he says, other people have said before, and quite a lot of them have been de declared heretical. Um, just let me pick up. Uh, yep. Do you want to go back? Show, show the screen. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll just go back to the text. So just go back to the mm -hmm. first paragraph at the very beginning. Yep. Um, so he he first of all talks about um, the number of many revelatory teachings given to me straight from God. Well, there's a couple of dynamics going on there. First of all, that's a massive power play because what he's saying is that because I've had these revelatory teachings straight from God, therefore I know more than you. I have this knowledge and you depend on me in order to receive that knowledge. Well, we we do get the language of revelation in the New Testament. It's really important. Um, Christianity is a revealed religion. We can't work out for ourselves that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Somebody has to tell us. It has to be revealed to us. That's true. And he's also right about the word group about apocalypsis, because apocalypsis does mean a revelation. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, as you'll know from my commentary, um, the revelation was actually... Uh, John was writing to people in his time saying you need to look at the world in a different way. So at one level, he's right. But at another level, he's completely wrong because there's a couple of things you need to notice in the New Testament. And the first is that uh, the New Testament is utterly, utterly communal in, in one sense. Um, although there are some people who've understood, who have believed, who trusted Jesus, a repeated emphasis all the time is that the good news, the gospel, the truth about God is out there in the public for anybody to receive. You find lots and lots of very universal language in the in the New Testament. And um, God desires that all should be saved. Jesus preached to all. You only have to read the beginning of Mark's gospel. And you see that the, the crowds that follow Jesus, that that he, he, he speaks to everybody. Anyone can hear. Anyone can listen. And mm. Jesus does distinguish between uh, the insiders and the outsiders. But. That's on the basis of the insiders are the ones who've heard his call and have responded to it. They're not a group of people who've been given secret knowledge that no one else could could hear. Because, of course, when he talks about um, those who hear and those who don't, he's actually quoting Isaiah, which are the, the public scriptures of Israel that are, are read in the synagogue every day. Um, Paul talks about revelatory experiences, particularly in, in 2 Corinthians 12. But one of the, <laughs> he's, he, he does a number of things. with it. First of all, he says, you know, the problem with revelatory experiences is they puff you up and they make you proud. And he didn't want that. That's why he was sharing his experiences. The other thing that Paul says is that he, he at some places, particularly in Galatians, he says that he 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 revealed he didn't just have ha man made traditions passed down to him. He had a revelation from God. But then he's really, really clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that the good news of the revelation of God that he's received. He had an encounter with Jesus on the road. This is exactly that. He actually uses a technical term, paradosis that this is a tradition about Jesus, which has been handed on to him and which he mm. then hands on to others. This is this is public knowledge. This is the tradition of the early community. This isn't some secret thing that's been kept in a quiet room. So it's 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 out there for everyone to see and for everyone to and share. And that tradition goes to months, within months of his death as well. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, ab ab and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, you know, mm. when you, all you have to read through is in Acts as you find that the gospel spreads God was, gospel spreads without any hindrance. You know, Luke repeatedly says, and the word grew, and the word grew, and God added to their number. Well, how mm -hmm. that looks like it's just God's action, but the way it happened was that the believers were scattered, and wherever they went, they talked to people, they talked to anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 the third dynamic here that you need to be aware of in the New Testament is that this revelation, this good news about Jesus, uh, every single New Testament document is emphatic that. This Jesus, God has got what God has done through this Jesus. He did in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Mm. So not only is it public, not only is it available, it's also discernible. And, and what's really interesting is that the one of the differences between the canonical gospels that the, uh, and the canonical scriptures, which are in our New Testament, compared with many of the documents that, that were not incorporated, that Gnostic texts, is that the Gnostic texts talk about secret knowledge and talk about an exclusive group. But the Gnostic texts also have nothing, no time at all for the Old Testament. So if if Jesus is revealed to us by his grace, then number one, it's public. Number two, it's communal. It's sh shared knowledge with others. That's why you cannot be a Christian on your own. You're, you're, mm. you're always, if you're called to God, you're always called in the community. But also it's in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. So it's there to be tested. And you see again and again, you, you see that, that mm -hmm. discussion between Jesus and the Jews about, you know, Jesus claiming that I'm, I'm the fulfillment of God's plan. So mm -hmm. I think we've got a problem with that first sentence at multiple levels. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I knew he'd go on to uh, Mark chapter one when he talked about the hidden secrets of the kingdom. And again, I've already already touched on that. Um, it is curious that when he gets to the book of Revelation, he doesn't get even the word right, even though he's emphasizing that we must go back to the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, the, the, the book of Revelation is called the book of Revelation. So if I go down over here. Yeah. 
like yeah. So it talks about Revelations two four, but it's not Revelations two four. It's a revelation. Uh, it's the Greek is the, the opening words are Apocalypsis Jesu Christu, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which He gave. And again, the really interesting thing is that uh, this revelation it's not a it's not a series of revelations, although. John says, and then I saw, and then I saw, and then I saw. As far as he's concerned, it is a revelation. And the reason for that is that the thing to be re revealed is not some esoteric secret or some plan for the future or some mystical knowledge that is only revealed to the elite. The reason that he has, he calls it a single revelation, is this. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, it, it's given by Jesus. Jesus is the, is the word of God, and it's through Jesus God speaks to us. And the, the written canonical scriptures are testimony to Jesus. So we have a written word, which is testimony to the living word. And that's how we encounter Jesus primarily through the scriptures. And that's how he, he becomes real to us. and We can welcome into our lives. Um, but but the point about the book of Revelation is it isn't there to give esoteric knowledge. It's there to enable us to understand who Jesus is and to understand what it means to be a, a follower of his. And again, it's really striking that when John has been given this revelation immediately in those early verses of Revelation, it says he gave them to John so that he could then pass it on and, and, and make it public. And in verse three, we see blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it. In other words, the social context in which this is being passed on is an individual lector who's reading the text, but they're reading it out loud in public. And that does correlate and it's, with it's that it's following that that uh, that trajectory of uh, one of the hypotheses is the uh, the mailman, so to speak, when he's going to the seven churches because the yeah. whole book is for yeah. those seven that go around in Asia Minor. It is but, because because you, yeah. because the, the the order of the names that they're given from Ephesus, Smyrna, and so on mm -hmm. are the order yeah. you would go around if you if you went in a, a in a clockwise direction around those main mm -hmm. main trade routes. So, yeah. so this is about this is about the, the public truth, and it's interesting that people treat the Book of Revelation as a kind of a code that has to be deciphered. But the, the it is a, a revelation, it is a revealing. I mean, John isn't trying to hide stuff; he's actually trying to make it. Make it visible, no, no. but but he's <laughs> doing so it in a way which would have made sense to mm. people in the first century. And because we're removed historically in a cultural distance and a linguistic distance, that's what causes the problem. It's not that it's not that John was trying to hide it. You know, even when you get to the most obscure verse, Revelation thirteen eighteen, and the, the the number of the beast. I mean, mm. as far as I can see, people would have understood John's readers, John's hearers would have understood immediately what he was talking about. It wouldn't have been hidden to them. It's only hidden from would us. You know, it, would you say it's Nero? Nero specific. Yeah, I think the most convincing yeah. interpretation of it's yeah. Nero Nero Kaiser yeah. because because that does add up to six hundred and sixty six, and or six one six and yeah six one six if you have a variant spelling mm -hmm. exactly which accounts for the right. um accounts for textual variants, mm -hmm. um and then I think the other the, the other thing I'd observe is that he does some really weird things here with with language. Now, I've never come across the idea that the Greek name Jesus means hail Zeus. I'd, I'd need to do some homework, but that sounds really odd to me. The mm -hmm. reason why we've got the Greek name Jesus is simply because when you transliterate from one language into another, so you, he, he's right in saying that um, the Hebrew name is Yeshua, which in our Old Testament is translated Joshua. But you get mm -hmm. odd things when you go from Hebrew and then you go to Greek and then you go to Latin and then you go to English. And the reason you get odd things mm -hmm. happening is because we do not have matching sets of letters and sounds. So as many of your viewers will know, um, Hebrew technically only has consonants. It doesn't have vowels. It does have some, mm -hmm. some consonants that function as vowels, like yod, um, mm -hmm. but, and, and vav, both of them can have a vowel function. But in Hebrew, you, 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 add, the, you add the vowels by putting pointing above and below the letters, and, and the main mm -hmm. text is consonantal. Now, that means that when you trans, transliterate or trans, transliterate into something like Greek, where you've got a mixture of vowels and consonants, and you've got a different, you've got a different set of letters available, then just odd things happen. And, and then when you trans, mm -hmm. transliterate into Latin, which is what's happened to our Bibles, has come through the Vulgate and translated by the Jerome, and then it's come into English. Then you get all sorts of odd things happening. So, for instance, the name James doesn't actually exist. It is. It's the name Jacobus in Greek. It's <laughs> yep. just it's just something odd's happened to it simply because of there's no conspiracy here. It's just what happens when you try and move from one language mm -hmm. alphabet set to, to another. Mm. Um, and I think it's pretty common nation that Yeshua means uh, God saves. And, and and that's that's exactly what's given us in the New Testament. He will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I mean, that's what the gospel mm, writers mm. tell us. So that that's no secret. But then he does something okay. really weird with the, with. The, sorry, you want to come back to me? I was just going to say because because I have some native 
uh, Hebrew and also Aramaic speakers, and right. and they they all point out as well like it's it's ironic that he doesn't he thinks Yehoshua and Yeshua are Hebrew, Yeshua is Aramaic, Yehoshua is the Hebrew, right, okay, and yeah, so yeah. I mean you know if you're going down that trajectory you want yeah you need to like, do your homework if you're gonna if you're gonna start yeah. up into original languages you actually need to know what you're doing right um, and and it's linguistically impossible basically for uh, you know the hail because hail zoo is because i was trying to look where did he get this from no idea it it's possible it could be from a zeitgeist sort of myth yeah. that he may have just come across and yeah but but the point is he the, the point is this man claims to have formal training in the languages he claims to have a PhD next to his name. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it takes you two seconds to realize this this person has no formal yes, training. Yes, exactly. It, that, 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 yeah. You see, that's my reaction. It's, it's absolutely and, evident. Yeah. Uh, it's, I would that, you you notice that just in the very right from the very beginning. He he hasn't engaged at all in any any basic mainline study of the New Testament here. And just right. going back to what he does with um, the parable of the sower in Luke chapter mm -hmm. eight. I don't particularly know why he chooses Luke's version to do that. It would be much more natural to choose Mark's in the sense that Mark introduces this parable as programmatic of Jesus' teaching, whereas Luke actually handles it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you can take the meaning of a word in one context and then simply meld that with the meaning of a word in another context, he, he seems to be treating language like a weird kind of jigsaw puzzle where you can just lift one piece from one place and if it fits in somewhere else, you can put it in there. The idea, I mean, the idea that because the word seed can mean, um, well, we, we get our word sperm from the Greek word for seed, sperma. Mm -hmm. um, in the New Testament, I'm just looking at examples here. Um, I'll bring the, up an interlinear as well for you. Yeah, to show the, you that, that sperm is not actually in Luke 8. It's uh, only in Matthew's account. Uh, well, sperma, the word sperma is in Matthew 13. Uh, yes. It's in Mark 4. But not, yeah, no, but it's not, it's not even. You're right. The word isn't even there. Yeah. Luke. No, I just yeah. got. I've got a word search here of all the all the occurrences of sperma, sperma. So it, yeah. it's it's meaning. It's it's one one sense of its meaning is um, uh, see, is is a seed that a farmer sows. Another does is the meaning seed in the sense of offspring. I I don't think that the word sperma has anything to do with sperm. Uh, I don't know what what you'd use for the word sperm i mean the, the problem is again that in the first century biology biological understandings are quite different from ours so it, it, yeah. you you can't you can't find you can't look for modern terminology in the new testament in in, in its ancient world mm -hmm. it's a basic it's a basic lesson of reading any text is you've got to read it in its historical context you can't simply lift or project modern ideas onto an ancient text mm -hmm. um the two the two basic meanings are seed as in the seed that a farmer sows and Seed meaning offspring. So we talk about Abraham's seed, meaning his his sons and then his line of progression. But the idea that you can take the meaning from one context and simply dump it into another and say, oh, there we go, da -da, that's what that's what it's talking about, is is crazy. And that's just simply not how language works. It's a bit like, it's a little bit like saying, um, well, we in our house at the front of our garden, we've got a well with water in. And it's a bit like saying we are a very healthy family because the word well means healthy and we've got a well mm. in our garden. Mm. Therefore, we're clearly a healthy family. Mm. <laughs> words have different what are called semantic domains and you have to mm -hmm. discern. I mean, words have multiple meanings. And if you want to mm. understand what a word means, you have to look at the context in which it's being used. So if my doctor says you're looking very well, then the word well there means healthy. If somebody says, mm -hmm. that's interesting, you've got a well in your front garden, then it's a completely different range of meaning for the word in a different context. Mm -hmm. And the idea you can simply lift one meaning and, and put, it in a, put it in a different context is just treating language like a bizarre kind of computer code, as if, as if mm -hmm. language isn't a bearer of meaning in context, which is, which is how language functions. So uh, he's, ba he's just basically um, breaking every rule of how anyone really who's thought about it understands how language works. I have the, uh, so since I use Logos, I have the very recently published Lexham Theological Wordbook. It's nothing but, especially for lay, the lay reader, yeah. um, they, they take the Greek yeah. and they take every semantic domain of, so in other words, they've, they've, they've amalgamated sporos and sperma together with a list of like another 20 different words. Right. And then the, the scholar who's, who's, who's written on it, let me just quickly show you what I'm, what mm. I'm saying here. He says that 
so here's here's the list uh so he he goes from the old testament all yep. the way into the new testament and yep. he's basically saying all these terms including sperma yeah is to do with it with is 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 because we're talking about an ag agrarian society a agricultural society yeah 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 and and it in fact it's quite rare for it to 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 be used in a sort of like genealogical sense but it's even in other words sperma genos you know um yeah. and then and then where sporos should be up here somewhere but mm. like mm. Oh, yeah. like doug he he says look um this is all agricultural terms so um yeah can you like maybe just give a a brief sort of reaction to um uh the usage of say lexicons because he uses vines strongs and then also this very peculiar jeff benner's work you know um ancient hebrew lexicon of the of the uh I think it's just called yeah. that ancient Hebrew, like, like what as a scholar, yeah, I like, think, yeah, I think, yeah. um, le yeah. lexicon, lexicons are really, really useful. And the reason lexicons are, lexicons are useful is that what they do effectively is they catalog the ways in which words have been used in a range of different contexts, and that's really helpful because it, it, it shows you that the, the range of ways a word has been used, for instance, in the New Testament. But also it'll give um, it'll, it'll give uses in other literature as well. Um, so you, you can mm -hmm. see the range of ways a term is used. The problem with lexicons is that people who are not familiar with the historical context, mm -hmm. they're not familiar with the literature, and they're not familiar with the way that language works and or the historical context, is they think that somehow a lexicon gives you a magical answer. So, for instance, mm -hmm. just take this word sporos, meaning seed. So yep. you've got here William William Williams has has given you. The range of places where this use this word is used. Now the question is, that's fine. He's given us that list, but how does he know the word means that in that in that particular example? For instance, how does he know that the word sporos means seed in Luke eight or in Matthew, in Mark four? There's there's no magical label which yes. tells you that. You you have right. to actually see it because you notice that mm -hmm. Jesus is talking about a farmer. You notice that the farmer is scattering this thing called a sporos and, and, and it goes, it falls into the ground and then plants grow up. So you think mm -hmm. to yourself, well, what can you scatter in the ground where plants grow up? What would we call that in English? We call that a seed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the only way you know that is from looking at the context and its use. And what lexicons do, some people think that lexicons give you a sort of a magical key, which separate from context and separate from usage gives you some sort of magical insight into what a word means. It doesn't. Words mean what they're used to mean. And what lexicons do is they helpfully gather up all those examples of usage. Now, but there is such a thing as outdated lexicons like Strong's, Vines. There, um, well, there are. And, and the, so there's a couple of problems with lexicons, mm -hmm. which is that in a sense right. that if, if, if somebody decides that a word in a context means X rather than Y, then they put that in the lexicon. You can't cite the lexicon as proof that the person is right in their interpretation, because all the lexicon mm. has done is actually embedded their view. <laughs> so, mm. so the idea that suppose I decided that the word seed actually meant plow, so that somebody plows the ground and then the plants grow out of it, and then I put that in my lexicon, it's no good somebody going to my lexicon and saying, oh, look, this lexicon says the word means plow, therefore it must mean plow in the text, because that's an mm. entirely circular argument. Mm -hmm. So you understand what words mean from the context in which they're used and the way that they're used and lexicons gather that up. So you have to look at lexicons fairly w with an awareness and an understanding. Um, for instance, now I can't remember which word it was. I was looking at a lexicon the other day because I was puzzled by the way that a word was used in one of the gospel texts. So I looked up on the lexicons and then mm -hmm. I, um, so I really should think of the actual example I could try that. And I thought, but that's odd. Why do they say the word means this? And, they are, and, and guess which verse they were citing as proof that the word meant that? The answer was the very text I was looking at. Oh. So the, ar <laughs> the argument right. was entirely circular. The lexicon didn't prove yeah. anything. All the lexicon was doing mm -hmm. was citing the very first verse I was puzzled about and, and mm -hmm. telling me what it thought the word meant. Well, that's no evidence at all. If you're actually going to mm -hmm. have a debate mm -hmm. about what words mean, you have to go beyond the text itself and look at the historical context, look at other texts in other, other contexts, look at other ancient literature. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, th these, are, these are serious discussions in biblical scholarship around, around terminology. I mean, the classic contest contested one 
is the word autentane in 1 Timothy 2, where Paul says, I'm not mm-hmm. permitting a woman to teach or have authority over, over a man. Well, what does the word autentane mean? It's no good going to a lexicon for your answer. Mm-hmm. But if the lexicon is written by someone who already believes the word means a certain thing in context, what you have to do is you have to go and look at other literature, you have to look at the, the historical context. You have to look at the way the word's been used in other places in order to understand mm-hmm. what it means. And that, that's mm-hmm. they, these are all the sort of bread and butter of disciplines about how to read texts well. And, and this man I, doesn't seem mm-hmm. to understand any of them. My, I think, uh, in closing, because that's absolutely a brilliant analysis, you know, that that you've given in your own way. Um, I think it, I think. I think that the the final like in closing like the final main point that yeah. that needs to be needs to be sort of like reacted to is he seems to harp on a lot with a particular verse in first corinthians 2 specifically yeah. verses yeah. 7 and 8 so he says upon seeing the symbolism throughout the scripture uh do we begin to recognize a hidden wisdom that not only paul wrote about but also all of the early church fathers wrote about uh, when we recognize, rec- when we begin to recognize the hidden meanings within the word, we begin to experience ascension and illumination that the early church taught occurred when one learned the secrets of the kingdom. And in other words, he 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 seems to emphasize a lot on yeah. Oregon, uh, you know, the the so-called allegorization. Um, yeah. Specifically, though, I want you to co- to comment. I'll I'll just share my logos again mm, on true. this notion of musterion. Um, yeah. You know the um, when Paul says yeah. that, so he goes. When we are among mature people, we do, we do speak a message of wisdom, but not the wisdom of this world or of the rulers of this mm. world. And maybe this yeah. phrase you can, if you can comment on that, who are passing off the scene. Instead, we speak about God's wisdom in a hidden secret, which God destined before the world began for our glory. None of the rulers of this world understood it, because if they had, they would not have crucified Jesus. And in my criticisms of Petro, I've noticed he starts to, in my in my response to Petro, as of yeah. late, yeah. he's avoiding verse eight now because I've explained the context that it's to do with the archons, right? That they don't know the plan because if they knew the plan, which is, you know, the gospel, right? Jesus coming and dying for us. If they knew yeah. that plan, why would Satan go out of his way to kill Jesus? It's, it's you know, it, it's his un, it's, it's his undoing, right? Yeah. So he conveniently avoids verse eight and six specifically with verse seven, this hidden secret, yeah. you know, that we are meant to like, because see, it's the apocalypse, right? And removing of the veil, and then that's yeah, when yeah, you sure. enter the hidden secret. Like, what's your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah. Well, again, it, it, a text without a context is a pretext. You can, you can take anything out of context <laughs> right. and you can make it mean yeah. anything you like. And what you've got to do is you've got to read this, first of all, within Paul. And Paul is absolutely clear. And he says it in 2 Corinthians. He says, when anyone is in the Lord, the veil is removed. Uh, mm-hmm. So he's drawing a parallel with Moses meeting God on Mount, on Mount Sinai. And he's saying that the veil is removed when we, when we confess Jesus as Lord and we receive the gift of the Spirit. That the Lord mm. is the Spirit. So this is for er- any Christian. Every it's it's, it's ev- for every Christian. The, these mysteries are revealed by the Spirit to us all. Again, every part of the New Testament is utterly communal. One Corinthians twelve is all about how the the Spirit, the same Spirit, by His own design, gives different gifts to everybody for the good of all. And you've got this mm. this constant refrain of each person for all each person for all there's no one person which has ma- who has magic gifts or magic secrets everybody has a gift of the spirit everybody has the veil removed all of us stand before the lord uh, and, and see his glory by the gift of mm-hmm. his spirit and and that's just part and parcel of the, the what i said before the universalizing language of the new testament second thing here is you've got to read it in the context of the of the, of the new testament as a whole and in particular you've got to read it in, in the context of his eschatology so uh, the the Jewish expectation was we have this age and the age to come. Ha'olam hazay, ha'olam haba. Uh, this age is evil and God's people are oppressed. God is not known. Uh, the, it's oppressed by sin. We can't, the people can't worship in holiness. The temple is corrupt and so on. When Messiah comes, all that will change. Jesus came, Messiah came. He cleansed the temple. He poured out the end time spirit. You know, at, at Pentecost, Peter said it's very clear. When they, when they say what's going on, what's all these people speaking in different languages and the, the spirits, the tongues of fire. 
Peter's very clear. This is that about which the prophet Joel wrote in those last days, in those end times. Mm -hmm. So the spirit yeah. came at the end. The end times began when Jesus was raised from the dead. Resurrection of the dead was a sign of the end times and when the spirits poured out. So we this what's happened now is we're living in the overlap of the ages because this sinful age continues. But we are beginning to live now in the age to come. The resurrection the already, but not yet the already, but not yet. When we're baptized yeah. in Romans six, we're baptized into Jesus. We, we die to this world. We're baptized into resurrection mm -hmm. life. That's everybody. That's every Christian. So we yeah. all, Paul says, have the mind mm -hmm. of Christ, not special individuals. And that's why leadership in the New Testament is always plural. So when Paul is here talking about God's wisdom in a hidden secret, which God destined before the world began for our glory, and he talks about the rulers of this world did not understand it, he means that it's only when you move from living in the mundane, living in this sinful age, and you begin to live resurrection life, when you're baptized, you accept Jesus, you trust him, and then you're baptized that's when you have access to these mysteries. It's not some elusive single prophet who's had revelations from God. It's each one of us. And and it's those mysteries prophet. from the East West sort of tradition is the say the sacraments. Like when you when you, you know, for example, in the Catholics, yeah. they're, they're trying to they try and yeah, transfer that over that, into the, the uh, again. We got a problem there because we know, got a problem from translation uh, from. Um, we have a problem in translation from Greek into Latin because right. the word mysterion in Ephesians into 5 is translated as sacramental. Yeah. Right. So that, mm. that's not, whatever whatever the subsequent history of interpretation, that is not what Paul meant. Paul does mm. not seem to have an understanding of special sacraments performed exactly. by a pre mm. priestly class. Paul sees the opposite. Because the end times gift of the Spirit is given to all, there is no longer a priestly cast because we're all now part of the priesthood of jesus the priestly people of god which is what he intended from the very beginning from uh, in, in exodus 19 6 you will be a kingdom of priests and mm -hmm. and god has fulfilled his purposes by pouring his spirit on us so we have our priestly ministry like paul's is the sacrifice offered to god of the lives of those who come to faith through our testimony that's our very good ministry. very good i'm glad you said that because in closing he says i kid you not i i heard one of his talks where he said all other churches and the Jesuses of these churches, basically other denominations, yeah. uh, they're not the Jesus I talk about. In other words, if you come, if you want to know the true Jesus, come to me. Yeah. And, well, he's sitting. He, 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 he yeah. point blank uh, says, he, I'm, I'm working yeah. for Satan. You're working for like he says, everyone's working for Satan except him yeah. and his congregation. Yeah. And it's, what he's doing is, is, is yeah. he's actually setting himself in, up in the place of God. And uh, he's actually committing the, the ultimate sin in the New Testament, which is the sin of idolatry and saying, I'm the one through whom you get wisdom. That place mm -hmm. belongs to Jesus only. Uh, when I, my last comment, because I've, I've, yep. I've got another meeting. That's it. Um, well, my, my great hero was David Watson, who was a charismatic, uh, he was a Church of England person. He, he met John Wimber. He had a charismatic experience. He was a great evangelist. Lots and lots of people came to faith. He, he uh, led a church into renewal in York and it, it became really influential. And despite all the things that God had done through him, he was absolutely insistent when, when he sat down with a group of other people reading the Bible, he said, no one sits at my feet because the, our only teacher is Jesus. We all together sit at the feet of Jesus. And I've taken that as my own mantra. When people say, I'd like to come and sit at your feet, I say, you, you don't. You never sit at my feet. What, if we're going to read the Bible, what we're going to do is we're going to open the Bible together and I'm going to share my insights from scholarship. You're going to share your insights by the spirit of God and through your, through your discipleship and through your experience. We all come together and we sit together at the feet of Jesus. Jesus says very clearly, I think it's in Luke 17, do not call anyone teacher for you only have one teacher. Do not call anyone master. Do not call anyone father. You have only one father in heaven. And mm -hmm. and and that that's the gospel. The truth that's comes in Matthew, to Matthew Matthew twenty five, I think. Is it? Either twenty five or twenty three, somewhere around there. Yeah. Twenty three, twenty three. Twenty five yeah. is the parable of the sheep and the goats. But yeah. No, I think twenty three then could be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, but well, he's really he's really clear. He says it more than once. You know, we only have one father, which who's God and God, and we only have one teacher who is Jesus. That's why, you know, with John's gospel, first thing people say is, Rabbi, where are you staying? Rabbi, which means being translated means teacher. Jesus Jesus is our only teacher, and it's and it's him we listen to. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Ian. God bless you. Uh, I hope you know that's useful anyway. It, thoroughly useful. I'm gonna, you know, stitch it down so you yeah, know for sure. any like yeah, pauses. And then uh, yeah. it'll be up maybe that's the thing. It depends on how fast everyone does it. Yeah. Like, I mean, I just would say few weeks, but, some of the things yeah. he says are true. So uh, the fact that he talks about apocalypse as being, being removing a vet, a covering, that, mm -hmm. that is true.
but it's a it's a word throughout the new testament it's the christian word for for the revelation of, of who jesus is to e each of us it's not some magical thing mm. for, for for a few elite thanks ian let's do this let's let's have a more yeah for sure let's talk about the book interview with you on on say yeah, your yeah. particular scholarship next time but uh yeah. it's such a pleasure to uh you know, oh, well, nice to connect with you. I hope it's, you. I hope it's yeah. useful stuff. And the Lord bless you in this. This is a, a, a significant task, I think. You're right. Thank you. Bless, bless you as well. Bless you. Finally, my my last guest is uh, the reappearance of my good friend Amir. Now, what Amir decided to do was, uh, so he's been he's been on here before. In fact, the the, the prior live stream I did, uh, you know, my conclusion on voice of healing. He um, he decided to go. Hey, look, I, I feel left out. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna be part of my. I wanna give my two cents, but in a much more truncated form. He couldn't. Re he couldn't really come on for, um, you know, like an hour long discussion about it because we already kind of did. Instead, what he decided to do was make like a two three minute snippet, and, and he just did two videos. Yeah, you you will officially see his face um and uh yeah i think i think he does a great job after everything after all this that you've heard so far uh amir has has uh i think you know the way he's the way he responds he puts the graphics at the bottom is uh nothing but um probably the highlight of this en entire four hour video so i hope you enjoy that and uh, and then I will end with a final comment. According to quote unquote apostle and quote Michael Petro in his book Access Behind the Veil, Jesus derived from Jesus means Hail Zeus, which is a very strange and erroneous claim. Well. Not surprising, given that he is subscribed to Hebrew roots type nonsense. And also the fact that Jesus is actually from the Hebrew and Aramaic Yehoshua and Yeshua. Yehoshua being Hebrew, Yeshua being Aramaic, Jesus is the Greek transliteration of that. Greek speaking Jews, when they were transliterating their names, Greek doesn't have an equivalent to Shin in Hebrew, so they opted for the Greek Sigma instead. More importantly, the statement, Jesus, Jesus, means Hail Zeus, uh, it's not found in any of any form academic lexicons, like, say, BDAG, um, the Greek and English lexicon of the New Testament and early Christian literature, and it is not even in Halot, which is the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. And these are standard academic sources. More importantly, uh, Joshua, uh, which is in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint translation, he's, it's translated as Jesus, uh, but the Hebrew it's Yehoshua. And in the book of Ezra, you have Jeshua, in Aramaic it's Yeshua, and that is translated as Jesus in Greek. Now, for it to be Hail Zeus, it would have to be Chayere Zeus, not Jesus. So premise one, if Jesus is Hail Zeus, then the Greek New Testament and in the Septuagint and other ancient Jewish literature in Greek, it would it would be Chayre Zeus. Premise two, it is not Chayre Zeus in any of these sources. Conclusion, Jesus does not equal Hail Zeus. According to Michael Petro, in Jesus' parable of the sower, uh, the seed that is the word of God contains not only mysteries, but the word seed is also referring to sperm or DNA. In the beginning of the preface of this book, he's claiming that these are teachings that he received directly from God. And also that his mind is continually being impregnated by the seed of creation. And of course, seed there in Petro's thinking is sperm or DNA. Now, in Matthew 13, the Greek there in reference to seed is sperma spermatos, uh, spermatos being the nominative case. Uh, it can refer to sperm, but it can also refer to actual seeds, like say you're planting something in the garden or out in the field. 
or it could refer to a characteristic trait uh, that's in you or implanted in you, and or refer to your children or posterity or descendants. The Greek sperma spermatos has a wide range of semantic usages. But Pedro wants to narrow it specifically referring to semen or sperm. However, given the nature of the parable of the sower and the audience that Jesus is teaching to, uh, it is highly unlikely that Jesus is actually referring to sperm in reference to the seed. It's in reference to just seed, as in an agricultural setting, uh, is an agricultural society. Now, in Luke eight eleven, the Greek there is not sperma spermatos; it is sporas. Sporas refers simply to seed. Just seed. That's it. It doesn't have any. Uh, it doesn't have that same uh, semantic usage in reference to spermatos, which could refer to as was referenced before. Uh, it also refers to sowing, and that is in an agricultural setting. Now, the DNA part. Nobody in the ancient world had any idea that there was such thing as DNA. It was not even in their thinking at all. That is a modern uh, scientific term. So Petro is both guilty of not only interpreting it anachronistically, he's also guilty of committing the etymological fallacy. While true, our English term sperm is derived from that Greek word sperma, spermatos. Uh, sp However, it doesn't follow that uh, our modern word sperm, which is in reference to semen, meant exactly the same thing as sperma, spermatos back in the day. That was one of its usages back then, but that was not its only usage. It had a much broader usage for other things, as noted before. Whereas in our English, word for sperm does not. But in Petra's thinking, anybody that receives the seed, the word of God, is being impregnated in their mind by the sperm of Jesus, of oh God. And yes, he does actually believe this, and it is as weird and strange, if not blasphemous, as it sounds. Okay, now, finally, what I'm going to do, I know this this is a very long video, <clears throat> I know this is a very long video, but I think it's relevant that I repaste from my Big Story series, the last episode of my big story series titled what is the gospel because i think i think that needs to be understood especially for those who are in voice of healing and especially for you michael petro if indeed you are watching up to this point um once you understand what the gospel is then you will understand why i find your theology to be satanic uh, it's 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 as uh, you know it's it's to be absolutely blunt it's pure gnostic satanism so if you still disagree at least see then how i argue what the gospel is which is practically all the scholars that i've interviewed so far would agree with me on that point once you see what i argue and obviously the, what the scholars argue uh, in the in the next 20 minutes of what the gospel is even if you disagree acknowledge or take note if you can why and how um, I uh, you know I argue the definition and I give like a you know the, the approach I take because based on the YouTube clips I've seen, based on little snippets on the Instagram and even on the Facebook, those one minute clips and so on, um, not once is there any direction towards the love of Christ with respect to his, you know, he, he, he offers salvation to people. And not once is there any sort of direction like it, like, like the meetings open and close, not on Jesus, but on you. You know, God told me, God told me, I'm this, I'm that. Uh, and then you just go into a tirade, uh, and frustrate, like a frustrating tirade on anything political. Um, 
where it, where is the gospel? Now you will say the gospel is unlocking the mysteries. That's all the gospel is. In fact, I've even seen clips on YouTube where you say that uh, Paul's gospel is not Jesus's gospel. Some some insane things like that. Um, and then you know, um, so putting all that aside, you know, you know what you believe. I know what I'm going to say here in the next 20 minutes is going to be radically different to what any VOH member has heard from you. But I pray that this last concluding point about what the gospel is, I pray um, for some form of humility and 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 a, and a, and a pro, you know a critical sort of humility to go, okay, give me your best shot. Why are you? Um, you know, because because I obviously disagree with you. Everyone I've just interviewed disagrees with you. If you're a VOH member, you should you should you know what should be flowing through your mind is, yeah, why? Don't automatically assert and insinuate or pretend and or you know imagine that we're all working for Satan. We're not. We're, you know, far from it. Um, so. For the sake of having a a you know a critical thinking mindset, you know, have, you know, try and engage and practice a peer reviewed perspective in this. Why is the the majority of the church different to Petro's version of the gospel? These next twenty minutes is going to show why, and if it convicts you. And this is to an EBOH member. If this next 20 minutes convicts you uh, in the sense of that uh, that is the gospel and you find it attractive and beautiful, praise God, because that's my intent in, uh, in sharing these next 20 minutes. All right. God bless everyone. Take care. In conclusion, what is the gospel? It does sound odd that I'm asking this question in this final episode, since we spent a lot of time walking through the story of the Bible, the story of how God wants us in his family, and we join that family by believing the gospel. But I've discovered that a lot of people who attend church don't really understand the gospel. This might sound hard to believe, but it's true. Some can't articulate it and others who can express it coherently often struggle with truly surrendering to its simplicity, that the gospel is all that's necessary for salvation. Now, you might be wondering what I'm talking about, and I'm willing to bet that as I explain what I mean, you'll either see yourself or someone you know in what follows. We'll start by defining the gospel and I'll ask some questions along the way that are important to consider for clarity. We also need to talk about what the gospel is not. And when we get to that part of the conversation, you'll see what I mean by Christians who struggle to articulate it. It's fairly easy to define what the term gospel means. The biblical word gospel refers to the message of salvation. The English word gospel is a translation of a Greek word that referred to a reward given to someone who brought good news. Hence, you'll often hear the term gospel equated with the good news about the message of salvation. Let's think about that. It might feel like we learned something. I suppose we did, but we didn't actually learn the thing we needed to know. It's nice that we can now define a term but we actually haven't said anything about the content of the message of salvation. We've defined what the word gospel refers to, but not what the gospel actually is. So let's talk about what the gospel means. What is the content of God's offer of salvation? What are the details of the good news? And why is it good news? The word appears roughly a hundred times in the New Testament, so we ought to be able to figure this out. 
Paul spoke about the gospel message more than any other New Testament writer. He used the word gospel for the message he preached about Jesus. Let's start with this pre-Pauline creed that dates to within months of Jesus' death and resurrection. Quote, Now I'm making known to you, brothers, the gospel that I proclaim to you, which you accepted, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are also being saved if you hold firmly to the message I proclaim to you, unless, of course, your faith was worthless. For I pass on to you the most important points that I received. The Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures and is still alive. Paul again defined the gospel in another letter. Quote, Paul, a servant of Jesus the Messiah, called to be an apostle and set apart for God's gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. He was a descendant of David with respect to his humanity and was declared by the resurrection from the dead to be the powerful Son of God according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. Through him we receive grace and a commission as an apostle to bring about faithful obedience among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name. You too are among those who have been called to belong to Jesus the Messiah. Notice that the content of the gospel emerges clearly in these passages. Here are the elements. First, God sent his divine son. Second, his divine son was born in the line of David. Third, his divine son becomes incarnate as a human messiah. Fourth, he is named Jesus, meaning God of salvation, which is the gospel. Fifth, his mission is to die for our sins. Sixth, after his death he was buried. And seventh, after his burial he rose from the dead. These items are the content of the good news. In other words, the Son of God became a man. He suffered and died on the cross so that our sins would no longer keep us out of God's family. He rose from the dead so that we could also overcome death and be with his Father, our, our Father, the only true God, forever. Let's probe that a bit. If this is the good news, why is it good? Lots of reasons. It's good because our salvation doesn't depend on our own performance. You don't see anything about your amazing track record or having a clean rap sheet in those passages. The content of the gospel is not about what you've done, or might do, or need to do. It's about what someone else did for you. That is good news for all of us, because none of us is perfect. None of us pleases God all the time. None of us is fit to live in his family and be called by his name on our own. We have to be made acceptable to God. The content of the gospel tells us how that happens. Notice that Paul described his ministry of telling people the good news as to bring about faithful obedience. He wanted those who heard his message to hold fast to what he said. How do you obey the gospel? Get baptized, give money, behave well, don't be a jerk, help the poor. Those are all worthwhile things, but no. God wants faithful obedience. You obey the gospel by believing it. Did you also notice that Paul didn't say, for example, the obedience of comprehension? We may not completely understand things like God becoming a man in Jesus, or how the resurrection could happen, that's okay. God doesn't demand we figure it all out, and then get back to him to take a final exam. He wants belief. Understanding why these things are rational can wait. The content of the gospel is God's offer to forgive you and give you a permanent place in his family. His offer shows his love and kindness. The Bible sometimes uses the word grace in the place of those terms. Since there is no greater power, God wasn't coerced into the offer. No one is twisting his arm. 
He offers you salvation because he wants you. All he asks is that you believe. That is the good news of the gospel. So why do we need the gospel? You might think I answered this already. I sort of did, at least in a roundabout way, but in light of my experience in Christian circles, I need to be blunt. Without it, we have no hope of everlasting life with God. Zero. We are estranged from God because of sin. Believing the gospel is the remedy. The Bible describes our predicament in several ways. Jesus said he was here to seek and to save the lost. By nature, we are dead because of your offenses and sins and ungodly. We were separated from the life of God and with a hostile attitude toward him because we were his enemies. It's not a pretty picture. The biblical story we walk through explains why we are what we are. We aren't born into the family of God. We're outsiders. Yet God wants us in the family. Lacking God's nature, we abuse our intelligence and freedom to get what we want, often harming others in the process. We live in self-destructive ways. When we don't image God and we break his laws, when we violate, manipulate, and otherwise abuse others, we sin. We are by nature sinners, self-absorbed and rebellious, because all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. It's easy to read that and be depressed or angry. But the good news of the gospel story is that God knew all that and loved us anyway. It's also useful for a reason that may never have occurred to you. It's what makes the gospel entirely different than any other religion's teachings about salvation. Every other religion either denies sin is a problem or says the solution is human performance. Repeating rituals, saying prayers, observing religious days, or otherwise being good. To be blunt, only the gospel is honest about the human situation and human inability to do a thing about it. Other religions, in effect, lie to you. They tell you that you can fix the problem of your own distance from God, or that you don't have a problem. The gospel is the only truth that tells you God had to provide the solution, and he did, whether you like it or not. The gospel is transparently honest. It tells you the truth even though it hurts. That shows love, and lying to you isn't love. But are there other ways to be saved? I more or less just answered this, but I want to approach the question from a different angle. God offers forgiveness, salvation, and everlasting life with him for free. It's not something earned or deserved. In fact, it cannot be earned or deserved. What's required is belief or faith. Putting one's trust in God's promise and the, comp- and the completeness of what Jesus did. But believing the gospel means not believing other teachings or ideas about salvation. The Bible says that there is no other way of salvation. Think about it. Why would God, the Father, send his Son to die such a horrible death on the cross if, it, if there were any other way for you to enter heaven? His divine Son had to become a man, and death had to be overcome. This was the only way, and believing in God's plan is the only way of salvation. There is no person besides Jesus who can save. Jesus himself puts it very bluntly, quote, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no ambiguity here. No one becomes a member of God's forever family except through what Jesus has done. You don't add the gospel to other beliefs. It is is exclusive. 
Believing the gospel means turning away from other beliefs. That's one aspect of what the Bible calls repentance. So what is not the gospel? Our discussion about the content of the gospel makes it clear that the gospel is about what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Everlasting life and salvation is a gift given to those who believe in what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Our culture tries to muddle this clarity. It offers self-improvement or vague spirituality as substitutes. But the biblical description of the gospel defies such things. The gospel and salvation has nothing to do with personal enlightenment, looking within on a journey of self-discovery. The gospel is not about exploring ideas from a spiritual smorgasbord. These are intellectual or psychological efforts and activities. They aren't the gospel, but these sorts of alternative gospels are the easy ones to detect and eliminate. There's a much more difficult hurdle that impedes many people from resting in the simplicity of the salvation God offers. I suggested earlier that a lot of people you'd meet in church struggle with the gospel. The reason is because they're caught in a performance trap. You, or someone you know, may be able to define the term gospel and perhaps even the content of its meaning. But the idea that believing what Jesus did for you is the sum total of what's necessary for everlasting life just doesn't seem right. Surely we have to do something. Otherwise, how could we deserve it? If you comprehend the Bible story and the content of the gospel, you should grasp immediately that we don't deserve what God offers. And that's a struggle for many people. We want to feel like we've earned the good news we have. We don't want to be a charity case. It feels wrong to get something good without having work for it, at least a little. Guilt distorts thinking in even more subtle ways. It can paralyze our ability to see the gospel as the unconditional gift it is. Guilt is what drives some people to justify a gift by concluding it's deserved because of something they did for the gift giver at some point and if they can't convince themselves of that they determine to do something after the fact to make themselves feel deserving of the gift guilt blinds us to the love of God shown in the gospel ultimately we must come to grips with how self-centered this thinking is that may sound harsh, but hear me out. Working hard to make someone else think you have value requires you to focus on yourself. You can't be focused on someone else when the goal is to make another person think you are worthy of their attention or love. We want to feel good about ourselves. In other words, we legitimately deserved something so we aren't taking what doesn't belong to us. We also want others to feel that way about us, too. In other words, we want others to give us something because of the way we make them feel about us. The gospel strips this away and casts it aside. It exposes us, demanding naked humility. It insists the focus be entirely on God and Jesus. That's why... It's a hard pill to swallow for so many. It doesn't let us take any credit. What it comes down to is that the gospel cares nothing about what you do, but cares everything about who you are. A fragile, mortal, corruptible human. But you're also the object of God's love and plan from the very beginning, and because of that truth, none of that requires performance. It just is. Because we're sinners living in a fallen world, we are locked into thinking no one would love us if they really knew us completely inside and out. Consequently, we can't imagine God loving us since there's nothing about us that escapes his attention. He knows every thought, word, impulse, and deed. The guilt that creates within us and the normality of our conditional relationships 
make the unfiltered love of God for us in the gospel hard to accept? From our perspective, it doesn't make sense. I should say at this point that I am not suggesting that people who hear the true gospel and embrace it with all sincerity aren't really saved. I honestly believe that they believe and are in the family of God. What I'm describing is the soul-crushing internal life many of those believers are still living. Their guilt has transformed the love and grace of the gospel into a performance-centered, merit-based experience. They begin to wonder if God still loves them like he did the moment they understood the gospel and believed it. They look at the sins they commit as believers as reasons for God to be unenthused and ambivalent toward them. They are convinced they can't measure up to God's expectations and wonder if they believed enough or perhaps didn't really believe at all when they thought they did. The sad truth is that many genuine Christians live tormented, defeated lives. Not because of the gospel, but because of the way their guilt has distorted the clarity of the gospel. When they read scripture, they see only their sins and failures. Every sermon is an indictment and shame on preachers who preach with that as their main intention. The spectacular wonder of the story gets lost and forgotten. Salvation is not about performance. It never was, never will be, and never can be. We can do nothing to put ourselves at the level of God, to make ourselves fit for his presence, because we lack God's perfect nature. We are like God, created to image him, but by definition we are less than God, and God knows it. That's why his solution was Jesus, not you. It's absurd to think we can bridge that gap or fill that void by doing this or not doing that. God never learns anything new about you when you fail. He's known you all along and still loved you right where you were and are. This is why Paul says, quote, God demonstrates his love for us by the fact that the Messiah died for us while we were still sinners. Did you catch that? Notice again. While we were still sinners. You do not need to perform at a sufficient level to prod God into loving you. If you give that some thought, it's really good news. God is never disappointed with you because he never has false expectations of your behavior. God has loved you all along, as Jesus affirmed. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his uniquely existing Son so that everyone who believes in him would not be lost but have eternal life. So, what's the big story of the Bible? We can boil it down to two facts. First, membership in God's family cannot be earned. It can only be received by faith. Second, God offers it because he is gracious and loving. There is no other reason, nor can there be. If you look at the nature of love, I mean, I, I've been spending a lot of time recently on 1 John 4, God is love. What does that really mean, right? Uh, it, it occurred to me that we all the time are talking about the adjectives that are applied to God. He's righteous, he's holy, he's sovereign, he's this, he's that, he's the other, the omnis, all that sort of stuff. You know, how about the nouns? What does it mean to say God is love? If God is love and the great commandment is all about us loving God with our whole being and our neighbor as ourself, and Jesus even said, love your enemies as yourself, and Paul says of faith, hope, and love, love is the greatest of these, and the first fruit of the whole, the whole fruit of the Spirit is love. Love must be pretty important to understanding God. If that's the case, then love has to be freely given and freely responded to. What God wanted is not automata. He wanted persons who personally decided to love and worship God. That, that's the essence of what God wanted more than anything else, just like a human family. I mean, you can order your children around all you want, but guess what? They have wills of their own, right? So God, God is the, the lover of his creation and the lover of his 
angelic as well as human beings, and he wants a free, loving response to him. That's the nature of what he wants in worship. It's what he wants in our lives. He thinks that's the way that, that a family grows and has a healthy life. Uh, it's the essence of worship. We, we could go on and on, but it goes back to the very character of God. God wants his very character of love and light and life replicated in our character in our lives uh, so that there really will be a family, both human and divine. Oh, that's great. Michael, as you have the final word here, Ben's just talked about the love of God and God desiring a response from people, free. Um, maybe somebody's watching today and they don't know God's love in their own personal life. And they hear about this idea that God loves them and he wants their response. Um, how can they have that in their life? I think, I think one of the big steps is the, you, you can't let your past, your self-perception get in the way of, of God and his love. You know, Romans 5.8 is a big deal. Romans 5.10 is lesser known, but Romans 5.8 says that God showed his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us. Verse 10 it says, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. Now, you know, that, that pretty much covers everything. It doesn't say while we were reforming ourselves, while we were getting our act together, while we were improving our behavior, while we were, you know, just fill in the blank. It says while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, okay, God loved us. So I think that's a huge hurdle for a lot of people. Um, they, they imagine themselves as somebody unlovable uh, because of one thing or a whole pattern in life. Okay. God do doesn't learn anything you know, when you think those thoughts. He saw everything. He knows about the things you thought about doing and never did. But while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And, and the message of the gospel is that not that you buck up and improve yourself so that God feels positively disposed toward you, right. so that you can get God to like you. That's not the gospel. The message of the gospel is simply believe that God does love you, and this is why he sent Christ, on the, and, and Christ died on the cross, rose again the third day, so that your sins could be forgiven, you, you become united in God's mind to the Son of God, to Jesus, and it's, 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 it's as though when, he, when God looks at you, he sees his son. Uh, you become part of the family. And all is forgiven. And, and all is forgiven. I mean, and the great none promise of these are obstacles. is that we will be conformed to the image of his son. Yeah, so we're going to become what we love and admire. That's fantastic. That's, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Wetherington. Thank you, Dr. Heiser. We hope that people will continue to just get in their Bible and read it and, and keep looking for God in the pages of Scripture and through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your service, both to the church and on this project. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome.